Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on weird and true mysterious stories, from glitches to the paranormal. This is my channel's monthly compendium for the month of November 2022. Enjoy the stories. Case file number 813, written by Cultural Afternoon 72. The Curious Case of the Missing Ketchup. This is a pretty simple anomaly, but it has been over a week and it's still driving me mad. So a couple weeks ago, my wife went grocery shopping. We'd been out of ketchup for a while, so I asked her to make sure she got some. We joked a bit, back and forth, with me emphasizing just how important more ketchup was. So she goes, gets home, and makes a big display of making sure I see the bottle and know she got it. Now an important detail here is that we technically live in a tiny home, 850 square feet. This means that when it comes to the kitchen, space is minimal. We have three large drawers we use as a pantry and our fridge. As far as food items are concerned, that's it. So a few days go by, and I'm making lunch. I go to grab the ketchup. I open the fridge, which doesn't have much in it. We recently moved, and there is no ketchup to be seen. I move the little bit of stuff around, but there's nothing. Okay, no big deal. It wasn't open, so she must have popped it into one of the pantry drawers. I go over and look, and it is nowhere to be found. Thinking I had just missed it, or maybe she slid it somewhere else, I asked my wife. She confirms she put it in the fridge and goes to look for it herself. We spend the next 40 minutes tearing the kitchen apart, not because ketchup is that important, but just because we both know it's there. We check behind the drawers, like maybe it fell, take everything out of the fridge, I even check the trash. We even ask our only daughter, who very rarely uses it, and she hasn't seen it either. Finally, we're both perplexed, but decide we've tried hard enough and we'll just buy more next time we're out. Two days go by, and I find myself making lunch again. I open the fridge, and damned if that bottle isn't sitting on the eye-level shelf, on its side, right up front. I naturally assume what everyone would, that somehow we had just missed it in one of the drawers or something, and my wife had found it. I go ask where it ended up being, and she looks at me like I'm crazy for a moment before saying she still has no idea. I explain what I'd just found, who had been in the fridge not long prior, went to go check because she didn't believe me. She opens the fridge sure enough and it's right there. So both of us are confused but there's only three people in the house, so obviously that means my daughter must have found it. I go ask her where it ended up being. She looks up at me in a very confused way and says, I haven't seen the ketchup? I mean, I had a dream last night that I found ketchup and put it in the fridge, but it wasn't our fridge in the dream, and I put it in while standing up. This bottle wouldn't fit standing on any of the shelves in the fridge. My daughter is 18, has no history of sleepwalking, lucid dreaming, or anything like that. The ketchup was in front of another bottle that I physically put my hands on, so it couldn't have just been overlooked. The bottle was still sealed, so no one had used it and left it somewhere else. I still have no idea where the goddamn ketchup went. Bonus file, written by 6081 Miles. My departed mother was still tagging along. I was once working as a receptionist at a five-star resort that's about 45 minutes from the city center. Everyone who has worked in tourism and or hospitality knows that there are certain periods during the year where it's busier than usual, i.e. peak season. This incident happened during peak season. The resort was overbooked and guests were checking into the rooms one after another at the reception counter. I was almost done checking in this nice lovely couple when I saw this family of five standing behind them and tried to finish up the whole check-in process so I could assist the family that was next in line. You must be thinking that when I said family of five, it's the parents and three kids, right? But it's actually two kids and one elderly woman, who at the time I assumed was either the husband's or wife's mother. Now, the resort's policy was to get the details of every guest that was staying in the resort, and it is for a good reason safety. It's the same reason that all airlines are doing when they obtain their passengers info. So I told a husband that we needed everyone's details and he said sure, no problem. And of course I was expecting five names on the registration form. 
By the time I realized there were only four names, the family were already at the concierge area to pick up their luggage and then left to go to their rooms. I couldn't go after them as I was assisting another guest. Like I said, it was peak season. So all I could do was just watch them from afar, walking towards the elevators, then disappearing from sight. The whole time they were walking, the old woman just followed them from behind, quietly. But I didn't give much thought to it and went right back to assist the guest that was in front of me. After the buzz had died down at around 4pm, I decided to ring the family's room to inform them that they were missing details. The husband came down to the reception alone and I told him I needed the info of his or his wife's mother's info. This man just stood there, stared at me for what felt like a minute and said, it's only my wife and I and our two kids. Me being confused obviously said, but sir, I saw there were five of you. At this point, I thought he was lying to avoid paying for a third person charge for one of the rooms. They got two rooms and one room has only enough amenities for two people. Same goes for the buffet breakfast that's included. He took another minute and asked me what this elderly woman looked like, to which I explained that she had grey hair and it was short, like a bob haircut. I also told him that she was wearing this red Changsem shirt, similar to this with long black slack pants. Right as I told him that, he quickly took out his phone, frantically scrolled for a few seconds and showed me a picture of the same woman in the same clothes lying in a closed coffin that had a clear glass cover so you could still look inside. I just nodded slightly and he said that it's his mother. She died unexpectedly a few months ago. I was, to no surprise, too shocked to say anything at this point. I somehow managed to mutter the words, I'm so sorry for your loss, sir. And I'm so sorry about this. He just said it was okay, gave me a small smile, then left without saying anything. When they checked out two days later, we just pretended like the whole thing never happened. Luckily enough, the elderly woman was not there. Still get goosebumps just thinking about it to this day. Case file number 814, written by Hawkeye, 8601. Darkness at Taco Bell. Me and my girlfriend are getting Taco Bell after a long day of work. Keep in mind, we work pretty late at a bar slash restaurant, so the time was around 10.30, maybe 11pm. We had ironically been watching Glitch in the Matrix stories for a few minutes before pulling into the drive through After waiting in line for a minute, as we were listening to music, everything goes dark. I mean everything. The streetlights, the Taco Bell signs, this is where we get weird. The cars around us lights went off as well. Everything went dark in the most literal sense possible. My girlfriend looks at me and asks if I saw what she saw, and for a second we had to take in what just happened. A power outage would make sense if it had been just the building lights or the street lights, but I can't explain how in that split second the lights in every car went off as well. It makes no sense. Everything seemed pretty normal after that, and we ate our food and continued back to our house. On the way back, listening to music, we played a little game thing we do where I asked her to pick a number, 1 through 10, and I skipped to the song that many skips away. I asked her to pick a number and she picked 5. I skipped 5 songs ahead and Vice City by Triple X starts playing. As the song is playing, I notice that the background music sounds reversed, so I asked my girlfriend to look up the reverse version on YouTube and play it. As we are listening, the reverse song says, when the lights go out, better run, girl. This freaked us both out, and I still don't know what to make of it. Case file number 815, written by Yo Adrian. Video evidence of a presentation I never gave. I give a lot of presentations at work. There was one particular presentation me and my team were working on, and after drafting slides and working on it, we decided it wasn't working. We scrapped it, and we had never turned it in. The draft slides have remained on my laptop for a good two months. Every now and again over that time, I've seen that draft and thought about deleting it, but always thought maybe we'd go back to it one day and it would be useful to keep it. Yesterday I had a meeting and I was prepared with a different presentation. My colleague introduced us and he then said, and now yo Adrian will give you your presentation, which is this draft we scrapped and never completed. 
Keeping professional and thankfully having kept the slides, I was able to make it up on the spot, but it was a bit of a mess. After the meeting, I asked him what happened, to which he was equally confused as to why I had messed this up and told me we had done that presentation several times. We had a pretty friendly disagreement about it. I was convinced he had introduced the wrong thing and he thought I had just messed up, and I would have agreed to disagree if it wasn't for him showing me a video on our company's Instagram page of me giving this very presentation before. I specifically remember the conversation of us scrapping it, of seeing the file on my laptop several times over the last two months and having that thought process of whether or not I should delete it. It even features a video I've never watched. When I've seen that in my drafts, I've thought to myself, I should probably watch that. Which I now have watched, whilst giving the presentation for the first time, desperately using the three minutes it took to play it to try and think about what the hell I was going to say next. I'm convinced that I never gave this presentation, in spite of the fact that there is a video of me giving this presentation. Bonus File, written by Clean Actuary 4547 Tragedy, death, and whistling. About two nights ago, I was sitting with my girlfriend and her sister in their backyard, inhaling plant matter in my car. We smoke often, so just a few is really nothing. Around 8pm, her sister went inside. We live in New York, the Bronx to be exact, so the sun was setting around 7pm and completely dark by 8pm. So now it was just me and my girl chilling. I'm rolling up and we're talking, getting rowdy and then laughing, nothing out of the ordinary. In her backyard, there's parking for about four cars, but they were all out and I was parked closest to her neighbor's fence on the right, facing the road. I can see all the way down the driveway, directly behind me is a mesh fence that you can clearly see through. Through that fence is a church. Over on my right, in her neighbor's yard, is a garden that you can see in. I'm saying all this to let you know I have a great view of her entire yard from the front to the back and the sides too, so I could have seen anyone or anything coming easily. Well, while we are talking, out of nowhere, we both hear a whistling sound, about two seconds long, loud and clear. Immediately freaked us both out so much that she ended up from the passenger seat onto my lap, but I was able to keep my composure and calm her down and get her to go back to her seat. This took about three minutes, and we were talking about it trying to find a logical explanation for what just happened. While we were doing this and basically calling anything paranormal not real and dismissing it as a cat or a squirrel or even my car, it happened again directly in my girlfriend's ear, loud and clear. I even heard it coming from her ear area. It was as if it was ensuring we could hear the whistling, whatever it was. My radio was off, as was the AC as it was a little chilly and windows closed tight, but it was as if the whistle was right next to her in the car. We stayed for another 20 minutes and decided she was too uncomfortable to stay there. She says weird things always happen in her house, but I never really take it seriously and I let her know that I don't believe in stuff like that. This time though, I experienced it myself and I looked and tried to think of everything to explain it, but I can't. I'm more scientific than religious, so I just want an explanation but this is a tough one. My girlfriend, her sister, and brother did put me on to some things that I have experienced growing up in the house, and I found it really interesting. When they were little, they used to play hide and seek, and my girlfriend, 22, would go hide in her sister's closet. Sometimes when she would go in there, she would see a pale little girl hiding with her, but she didn't get any bad vibes, so she never bothered with her. I questioned this like I questioned everything and she said she was probably just too young to think much of it. When they were kids, my girlfriend's brother said he once saw a little girl running down the hallway but thought it was one of the sister's friends. But when he couldn't find her at the end of the hall, he asked his sister and they both confirmed they didn't have anyone over. About a month ago, around 11pm, my girlfriend was sitting in her living room and heard someone in the kitchen taking stuff out to make tea. But when she went to go see who it was, the stuff was just left on the stove as if someone left in a hurry. In the morning, she asked everyone and nobody had been making tea. A few years ago, her mom's brother ended his life and they didn't find out until a few months after because some of the family issues made them not very close to him. 
but his wife had some personal issues. I don't know the full details. At one point, he used to live there with them, and when my girl's parents got divorced, he took care of them like he was their own. Before they bought the house when she was two, a doctor lived there, and the doctor had a daughter that was fine at one point, and after an accident, she became paralyzed. You can see this throughout, with the door frames being bigger to accommodate wheelchairs and a ramp outside. That girl ended up dying in the house some years after her injury. Case file number 816. Written by Yas Bjorn, the dead pixel of space-time. I was walking through my kitchen towards my garage when I happened to look up and noticed a small black dot hovering between my head and the ceiling. At first I thought it was a fruit fly, but when I focused on it, it was pure black, round and stationary. I poked at it and it moved slightly to the left of my finger and hovered there. When I removed my finger, it returned to its first position. I thought it might be some dust on a cobweb, so I ran my hand above it to break the web, but nothing happened, it still floated there. I stared at it for a few seconds and noticed the area around it kind of blurred the ceiling above it, like a drop of water would. I poked at it again. It moved out of the way again, similar to how magnets move when you try to push the same poles together. I ran my hand in a circle around it. It didn't move. I changed positions and poked at it some more. It would move, but it always returned to its original position. Finally, I decided to put both my hands on either side and clap. Confident I had captured the culprit, I searched the palm of my hands for the speck. Nothing. I thought it was weird, but several times since, I walk under that spot and get goosebumps, but not in a fearful way like a joyous feeling. I look for it often, but haven't seen it since. Has anyone else seen the tiny black dot? Case file number 817, written by Rich Erizard 92 If you're about to die, just rewind time. I have had this happen three distinct times several years apart. First was when I was an idiotic 16-year-old. I had recently gotten my license and was driving myself and my little sister home from school. I was cocky and tried showing off for her, turning up the music and headbanging for a few seconds. When I opened my eyes, I remember being a moment away from hitting a parked car. The very next moment, I was two blocks back where I turned onto the street. I pulled over in a panic and my sister asked why I was stopping. I asked her about that moment at least 10 years later and she said she doesn't remember me headbanging or the music being loud, just wondering why I was stopping so far from home. Second, I was driving to a music festival when I was 20. The festival was a three hour drive away and I went with two friends, one of which said we could take his new white Mustang. It was super early and he said he was up late the night before, so he insisted that I drive. As we neared the festival, I got to a winding inner city highway on-ramp and I couldn't see the approaching traffic very easily and I wasn't familiar with driving in the area. So I treated it as any other on-ramp and I swear we got hit by a semi that I saw last minute but the next instant I was at a complete stop at the end of the on-ramp with the semi crossing in front of us. I never brought that up with the other two since I was driving someone else's new car and it felt wrong to mention. Finally, I was in my early 20s and remember driving across the state with my sister on our way back from visiting family. It was late, probably 10 p.m. I was in the left-hand lane and someone came up on me faster than I had anticipated. It passed me on the right as I saw another car approaching quickly. I moved to the right lane immediately as the first car passed me to get out of the way of the second car. I hear a loud grinding sound as I hit the back trailer the first car was pulling only to blink and see the first car and trailer were well ahead of me. There was no damage to my car and my sister didn't see or hear anything weird once again. I'm at the point where I try to avoid driving if possible. I'd rather offer to just pay to help someone cover the cost of gas if it means I don't have to drive. I've been sitting on these for a while now and I think about them pretty regularly whenever I'm on a long trip. Bonus file, written by Iridium69420. Spirits so potent, we cried. Earlier this spring, me and a friend were in Naples, Italy. 
One night, around 2 to 3 a.m., when we were headed home to our hotel, a girl between 9 and 12 years old danced up to us and asked us for a cigarette. She did this in perfect English. We told her that we didn't have any cigarettes and she followed up with, Do you have a lighter? I had a lighter on me and I gave it to her. The fact that this was a literal child didn't cross my mind even once, and I, to be completely honest, would have given her a cigarette too if I had one. It felt like she could have asked for anything and I would have complied instantly. It felt like she was in total control. After she received the lighter, she said, Thanks, and danced along further up the street. During this whole interaction, I had the feeling that something wasn't quite right, and after she moved on, I said to my friend, Yeah, that was a spirit or something. What the hell was that? And my friend totally agreed. Both me and my friend are not very superstitious or spiritual, and we sat up until early morning just talking about this experience. Both of us began crying somehow after she left, and it all felt really weird. I really can't explain what that was, but it was like a rush all through my body, and both me and my friend are still to this day convinced she wasn't human. Also, she had a boy with her, even younger, but he did not say a word. I don't even know if this makes any sense at all, but it is what it is. I think about it pretty much every day and I just can't let go of the thought that this was something out of this world. Many have asked, no, she did not have black eyes. She took the lighter with her. It isn't the fact that a child asks for cigarettes in the night that's eerie, it's just the feeling we got from both of them. Either you believe me or not, it doesn't really matter either way. Mainly I wanted to know if someone else had felt something similar to this. Case file number 818, written by The Marco Nation. The universe broke me and my girlfriend up. I just remembered the craziest thing that is just unexplainable. At the time, I had been with my girlfriend for about two years and we lived together. One day, while doing laundry, she comes into the living room where I am and holds up a pair of women's underwear. I don't know why they call them a pair since it's only one, but I digress. Yes, a pair of underwear that were much larger than the ones she wears. For context, she's 5'1 and maybe 100 pounds. These were at least a large pair and they were of the granny panty variety, whereas my girlfriend has thongs and boy shorts and basically everything from pink or VS. She is pissed and says, whose panties are these? I look up and I'm dumbfounded. I have no idea. I'm stunned. Now, this isn't an area that has older clothes or like out of storage. This is in this week's laundry basket. I spend the next 5 hours baffled and trying to explain that I have literally no idea how a pair of random panties are in our current laundry basket. I don't know if you've ever been accused of something you've never done, but as I am so adamantly defending myself, the more guilty I'm appearing, as I'm sure some people are currently thinking about me. <laughs> I was not responsible for these panties, no way, no how. We had a huge fight and I think that was the start of us eventually breaking up. I am telling you in no uncertain terms, these panties magically appeared and to this day I still have no earthly idea how. And yes, I realize that even writing this I sound guilty, <laughs> trust me, I was not. Case file number 819, written by Avengion 619. What if our consciousness can hop universes together? I'm married. My wife and I have two separate people try to ruin our relationship. Their names are Jasmine and Horatio, who goes by just H. We are very dark humor individuals and grief each other in a healthy comical way. So anything like Jasmine tea, rice, scents, flowers, etc. My wife would supplement with the whore, rice, tea, flour, etc. There is an H street a few exits from where we live and we frequent buying food and going to the mall which is the H street mall. We both poke fun at these occurrences as our own little inside jokes. Reference point. One particular joke is a grunge band Local H, bound for the floor. It pops up fairly frequently on my phone's playlist when we are driving together which is always a good laugh. One of the lyrics in the chorus is, you just don't get it, you keep it copacetic. My wife has said, keep it copacetic, numerous times. We have listened to this song numerous times. 
I have a phenomenal memory, so good I say, it is a gift and a curse quality, much like the titular character from the TV series Monk. Glitch. My wife was playing our game just moments ago, and we were alternating impromptu jokes. It was her 35th birthday yesterday. We had a blast this weekend. We are just celebrating a lazy month at home before we both go to work in the evening. I brought up the song. I played it for her and she is looking at me with the blankest of stares. She claims she has never heard the song and has never used the chorus line. I started recalling all of the instances we have had interactions and she just cannot recall. Is she a different consciousness or am I? Bonus. My wife has told me and our son, who is now 18, about breaking her arm as a kid. We both recall her saying she fell out of a tree she was climbing. It is now a joke because she says she's never fallen out of a tree and that is not how she broke it. We had repeated instances of this argument. A year or two back, she asked her son and daughters and they all said she fell out of a tree and that is how she broke it. My mother-in-law confirms she never fell out of a tree, so why do my kids and I have a recollection that we were told the arm break was from a tree fall? Mind you, as I mentioned, I have a ridiculously great memory. My son, not so much, but we arrived at the same point. There are too many instances of occurrences, and this is not a misinterpretation or memory issue. Something with myself or the people around me has changed or been changed from what I know. I had to put my headphones on and blast music. I told my wife I'm not upset with her because I was sounding upset after my explanation, but I'm just so confused. I told her I'm just freaking out now and need a minute. So here I am blasting music in my eardrums and venting out this post. Bonus file, written by IDFK 0987654321. My cat detected an entity. My apartment is kinda notorious for the spooks. You know, things moving, doors opening or closing, the usual. We also have a mimic that likes to pretend to be my kid or my little niece calling or crying for me. There was one day with a lot of mimicking that I ended up with a couple little scratches on my collarbone out of nowhere. I was just sitting at the dining room table. I digress. Things have been quiet. I mean, today I've seen some shadowy out of the corner of my eye kind of things, but nothing crazy. Tonight, my cat comes tearing down the hallway, like speeding, and skids across the back of the couch. Now this is a big old lazy Maine Coon, so already his running was disconcerting. But as soon as he skidded across the back of the couch that I was facing, I felt this aggressive touch on my back, the entire length of my ribcage on my left side. Not like scratches, but like someone digging their fingers in and dragging them down. No one was in the room with me. In fact, I had to go hunt my cousin down because I was so freaked out. Now, over two hours later, it feels like the muscle in that part of my back is burning. It doesn't hurt exactly, it's just uncomfortable. Today, the energy in the apartment has felt super off. If you've ever had that derealized feeling, it's been like that, where something just feels off enough to make reality questionable, and I keep feeling the little curls at the base of my neck getting touched. My back muscle is still tense and burning nearly 24 hours later. Case file number 820, written by Starry Mari. The Matrimonious Glitch in the Matrix I was laying in bed next to my boyfriend late in the evening. We were having a conversation and then he fell asleep. I'm a night owl, so I usually stay up for a while after he falls asleep. I started thinking of wedding dresses because my friend recently got married and I planned to marry this boyfriend of mine one day, so I was just kind of daydreaming about what my own dress might look like. My boyfriend wakes up out of nowhere. Boyfriend? What? Me? What? What did you say? I didn't say anything. You said something about a wedding dress? Sorry, I fell asleep. Our conversation we had before he fell asleep was completely unrelated. At no point in time did we discuss weddings. I thought about a wedding dress. I didn't say anything out loud. I told him this and we both thought it was creepy, but pretty cool at the same time. Case file number 821, written by Sly Fox in a Cave. Tourists from a Parallel Universe. 
I work in the industrial district of my city. It's one way in and one way out, so we call it the island. There's a single convenience store. Last night I stopped by as I usually do after work. There were no cars there but at least 20 or so tourists. I see this often but I saw no bus this time. As I got my stuff and got in line, I began getting looks from all of them, like I was out of place. I just kept to myself and stood in line. A minute later a couple ladies from the group came and stood in line, right next to me. Not slightly behind me by any means, directly next to me. The line moved forward, we moved forward, we got to the registers, we put our stuff down. I'm just flat out confused but the cashier only rang me up for my stuff. As I left, a group of them were walking directly towards my car. At this point I'm getting nervous. As I walk closer to my car, the group is almost intentionally walking to it too. Then one guy stops about two feet from the driver door and just stands there. I shuffle between him to open my door and the guy looks at me and asks me a question in a language I don't understand. I just silently got in my car and started it. I took one last glance over and about six of them were all standing a few feet from my car in a line with blank stares. I drove off and felt like I was in a dream for most of the ride home. At first I thought it was a cultural thing inside the store where the bigger the group the tighter the line or something, but the car experience still has me a little freaked out. Case file number 822, written by RRHN711. Time froze. But there was a voice. Hello everyone. First of all, I'm Brazilian and my main language is Portuguese. So while I've studied English for 12 years now, there might be some grammar mistakes. I was born in 2003, so I'm 19 now. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but it was certainly between 2007 and 2009 when I was 4 to 6 years old. There were days when I would ask questions about the world around me which is natural for that age. The thing is, I recall at least two events in which I asked a question, I don't remember what the question was, but I'm almost certain one of them was about trees, and suddenly everything around me stopped moving for a very short time, as if all time had stopped except for myself. While the time was paralyzed, someone would talk to me, answering the questions. I recall on both occasions the voice who answered me was a soft male voice. Anyone would be scared by that but the voice was so friendly that hearing it made me feel at peace. After the voice answered my questions, and I didn't know about the answers it gave me so there is no way I could have just imagined it, time would return to normal like nothing happened. Eventually, after it happened the second time, it never happened again. I eventually forgot about it save for a single occasion that I remembered back in 2012 until 2019, when for some reason I remembered those events and never forgot again. Also, in 2019, around October December, I was in my grandparents' room staring at the night sky when my eyes fixated on a cloud for no reason. It was no different from any other cloud, but it made me curious so I kept staring at it. Suddenly, a blue sphere of light passed through that cloud at an impressive speed. I didn't manage to look too much at it, but I remember that besides the blue color it had a bright white core. I'm not sure if this is related to the voice that I used to hear when I was a kid or not. Both my grandparents also had experiences with UFOs when they were younger. My late grandpa saw one as a child, and my grandma was still a baby at the time but her mother and grandmother saw it and then told her about it. Well that's it, a lot of people have experiences with UFOs but I was curious if anyone here experienced something like my first story. Bonus file written by Master Test 6912 Spiritual Lingering My mom would tell me the story that when I was a kid I used to see a ghost in our house every now and then. She would say that I would start crying out of nowhere, scared to death. I would say, She's back! And my mom asked, What does she want? I would say, She's just visiting. Now I took the story with a grain of salt, but over the years I'm starting to piece it together. Now it could be that my mind is making memories to back up my thoughts, but who knows. My mom told me that I would say she is a very elderly black lady, one of those really old school flower blouses, you know, 
crap your grandma would wear. One of those cloth hats, not sure the name of. If you know the movie Friday, the outfit that the Jehovah Witnesses were wearing is pretty much it exactly. All I remember now is seeing the back of her, her walking down the hallway away from my door. Now here is where it gets freaky. About five years ago, when my mom started dating her now ex-husband, years after the whole situation, my stepdad had a nightmare. A nightmare where that exact lady was standing on the end of the bed looking at him. My mom never told him about this lady. We have since moved from that house, so we haven't seen her since we were there. Asking my mom about the story sounds like, from what she said, she didn't have a hat. She had white dreadlocks. She had a hunchback and a cane. I would freeze my entire body and just point, shake, and make noises towards the hallway. I would say, she's just passing through. It started when I was four. About my stepdad's dream, she was standing right over his face, just staring at him, almost like she was trying to figure out who he was. Turns out we moved because he was so freaked out. He confirmed the hair and the hunchback in his dream. My mom would say she would always jump, like someone was behind her. I guess I told my mom she had funny hair, because I guess too young to know what dreads were. <laughs> my mom even had a healer walk through the house and she said that there was something there, but she had no ill intentions. She told my mom the next time she feels someone behind her, tell her to leave. After that, she said she didn't feel anything in the house except she felt that something would watch her from the windows. If you're not aware, you can join the channel now, become a member, helping to support me. You can join for as little as a dollar a month. You can also join for five dollars a month and gain access to my horror narrations. Or you can join on Patreon for the same amount. Regardless, enjoy the stories. Case Notes for File 813 The Curious Case of the Missing Ketchup So, this is the first account of a DOP, Disappearing Object Phenomenon, where there seems to be a connection to the entity that stole the ketchup, or maybe received it in their realm or dimension. And then, as they returned it, your daughter was able to connect, sort of telepathically, in a dream state, with this entity. Sort of like witnessing through its eyes, um, like in Harry Potter, he would uh, see through Nagini's eyes. When Nagini was attacking Ron's father, <laughs> of course this is real life though, not some grand mystical adventure. Although I guess it sort of is a grand adventure, isn't it? The whole thing is quite peculiar though. I mean, why ketchup? Yeah, sure, it's delicious. Let's be honest about that. On french fries, oh my god, on hamburgers, on pretty much anything that's not sweet, it's amazing. Gives that proper balance that is needed. Stealing bacon and stealing ketchup? I can understand that. Or if it's just the universe glitches out and it ends up being in our dimension, I wouldn't return it, I would keep it. Yeah, unless they're allergic to it or something. Like dogs uh, can't eat chocolate. That's so unfair. Case notes for the bonus file. My departed mother was still tagging along. I have to say, I was forming some tears in my eyes towards the end reading this. It's beautiful though in a way, isn't it? You know, the idea that the loved ones that we care for, they're still around in some aspect, even if it's just a fragment of who they were. Just knowing that there's some remnant of them left over. In another universe, of course, we know quantum immortality. There's something more potent about being here in a way that we can detect. As you know, quantum immortality is an interesting theory, and I think it's very likely, but it's still just speculation in a way. There's no real way to prove it outside of experiencing it for yourself, and even then it's kind of hard to play sometimes, outside of anomalies between universes. So yeah, imagine how he would have felt. You know, he's just checking into some hotel or resort, and the receptionist sees his mother behind, tagging along, just wanting to make sure her son is doing well. That's so amazing to me. Tagging along on all his adventures, forevermore. Although she wasn't there when they left. Was she just turning invisible to the receptionist? And why make herself visible only to her? Or is that just an accidental fact? The receptionist, maybe maybe people's brains are just wired specifically to seeing that spectrum. Sort of reminds me of that blue and black dress and the white and gold dress, where some people would see it as white and gold when in reality it was blue and black. Some people's brains literally are just wired differently. Now I think this is much more rare than that, 
It's a fact of reality. We're not all the same. We have different parameters that govern our perception, different filters. Some people's filters are diminished, I think, in a good way. Case notes for file 814. Darkness at Taco Bell. So yeah, we're back to being clean shaven. I don't know if I like this more or not. Let me know what you think. When it's colder, I, I like to keep it longer, but just felt more proper. So often in these perceived events where the light goes out and there's no audio playing, it's as if you become deaf for just like a split second, maybe one second, as reported. Often people assume that this has some relation to the sun itself, but I don't think so. I think any light, any fluctuations within the EM spectrum are affected, and including the vibrations in the air, which are just another form of wave compressing throughout the atmosphere. Then we interpret that as sound through our ears and brain. But yeah, it all seems to be dampened. I guess a dampening field would be the best approximation. As far as light goes and electronics, an EM pulse bomb, which can be accompanied by nuclear weapons, can cause that. But obviously there was no bomb going off in the area, so I'm not sure. There are just uh, EM pulse generators, but again, it should last much longer than a couple seconds. Those would actually fry the components in the car and just leave them as bricks that would have to be pushed. There is also a possibility of cosmic particles. So charged particles from the sun can impact electronics, especially GPS satellites in space, or just satellites in general. Uh, the ISS has to deal with this all the time. There is an EM field around the planet that protects us, usually, although sometimes they filter in. And then you get the Aurora Borealis, although sometimes there are still particles that manage to pierce the atmosphere and the EM field, and those can actually affect electronics. Whenever you get a random blue screen of death on your computer, it's often attributed to just cosmic particles crashing in and damaging the component or just disrupting the flow, causing a computational error, and then you have to restart. Pretty rare these days, there's a lot of redundancy in the code and uh, hardware. Outside of those things, it might just be more evidence of simulation instability. Seems to be rather common these days, or at least reported more often. Maybe it's always been this way and just more people are realizing that, yeah, we should talk about this stuff. I would certainly hope that's the case and the universe isn't becoming more unstable. That would uh, be unfortunate. Case notes for file 815. Video evidence of a presentation I never gave. Right, so I have to be honest. Even though I know about quantum immortality, multiverse theory, and all that stuff, to have direct video evidence of doing something that I know I never did, well, it would make you completely freak out and question your own memory. It's sort of like the Mandela effect taken on Kaioken steroids. You know, <laughs> all the SARMs in the world couldn't really make you feel just how crazy that would make anyone feel. You uh, seem to be handling it pretty well, so props to you on that. So could it be a memory block? You do have the files, although there was one that you didn't remember uh, playing, including the presentation. It could be a crossover, obviously that's always possible. You're in a different universe and now these things happen where you don't remember them because you weren't really the one that did it. Just a copy of you that you're now inhabiting. But I have to say though, memory control, memory distortions, there's a reason it's often used in dystopian sci-fi, because it's so unnerving. If we can't trust ourselves and our own recollections of what happened in the past, it's almost like we can't trust that we are who we are. We lose ourselves if we don't have our memories. It's very disturbing. Case notes for the bonus file. Tragedy, death, and whistling. So I've personally heard a noise that no one else was around, was just me, but it was a noise, just a cell phone ringtone. It wasn't my cell phone, and there was nothing else around that was causing it that I could find. Just a noise that didn't belong and didn't fit. It's like it was being played somewhere else and transposed into my area. Sort of like this whistling sound. Would you say kinda came from the car right by your girlfriend's ear? Could it have been some sort of entity that was capable of whistling? Maybe. I mean, do these spirits or echoes also breathe air? Are they able to affect the atmosphere with their vocal cords or their tongue? Maybe. <laughs> if they're able to move objects, it's probably not the default state, but maybe they're able to eventually train themselves to, uh, to learn how to do that. I suppose it does make for a good uh, mind warping. <laughs> Just something to do to prank people. If you think about it, if spirits are there and there's even a shred of sentience, you know, they're just somewhat aware of being that they're alive, or alive, that they exist, they would probably get bored. So, I mean, it's not unreasonable to think that a lot of them would just turn to pranks. What else are they going to do? 
watch the same people, eat the same food, and go to the same places, although, you know, eventually I would get boring, so you gotta have some fun. Case Notes for File 816 The Dead Pixel of Spacetime This is interesting because there's a contrast here between you feeling joyous in the idea of seeing this black dot again, and me, I was reading this and I actually felt nervous all along. Something about the story is deeply unsettling to me. Does anyone else get that? It's almost like a rip in spacetime, like the very fabric of the universe is degrading. And something about that really <laughs> messes with me. Obviously, I don't want the universe to distort and collapse on itself or anything like that. Sort of like the universe becoming corrupt. I guess it repaired itself because the dot disappeared, but that shouldn't be happening at all, right? There was a comment that's less creepy, in my view, is that this is some sort of surveillance device, high tech. I'm not sure exactly how that would work or function, but that's uh, better than the universe showing signs of degradation or corruption. I'll go with that one for now, <laughs> just to spare my mind. Case notes for file 817. If you're about to die, just rewind time. Why didn't we think about that? <laughs> So this seems like possibly just a lot of cases of quantum immortality. You're constantly jumping between universes because you're coming close to death all these times or you actually do die in these universes. But it's happening to you so frequently, it might actually not be quantum immortality. Your own mind might be simulating these events in what feels like reality to you. Sort of like Nicolas Cage's character in uh, Next, the movie, where he's able to project into the future sort of like running simulations of what the future is, or various possible futures. And your mind's doing this to, as a defense mechanism, perhaps? Just, uh, I mean, driving is very dangerous, and maybe your subconscious is extremely attuned to this, and so you're trying to protect yourself by playing out different scenarios that could possibly happen, and then avoiding them. There's a buffer effect here, and that's the other thing I was speculating on the other day, is that Maybe all of this reality that we perceive is, is a buffer of choices we already made, events that already happened, and we're just living it as a replay, snapshot. We're still making the choices ourselves, but it's all already done, and we're just going along with the flow of what we actually happened, and we don't know until we get there. But that information already exists, at least a little bit ahead. Obviously, just speculation, and how much is buffered, I don't know. The entire scope of the universe is future? Case notes for the bonus file. Spirit so potent, we cried. So this is a local legend from Italy. It's the two children from Portici or Portici Road. They'll ask for anything they can use to set something ablaze, create fire. But the most disturbing thing is if you have nothing to offer, supposedly the little boy will then approach you and tell you how your mortal coil will end, how you die. Interesting legend though. It seems to mesh because you, you felt so uneasy. Maybe it was just the area being in a new place. Local legends, they probably have some validity. Case notes for file 818. The universe broke my girlfriend and I up. So one possible explanation for this is that she just had a friend over that was on the larger side, at least relative to her. And somehow, one of her granny panties ended up in your ex's bin. Now, it's true that reverse disappearing object phenomena, or DOP, does happen. It's not as common, but objects go missing and they reappear. Not always in the same place that they were in when they disappeared. Sometimes, they'll reappear somewhere else. Maybe some girl lost a pair of her panties and they just ended up in your ex's bin. And maybe there is some point to that. Maybe some sort of a developer prank? Or there's some reason why your ex and you shouldn't have been together. So like angels in the adjustment bureau, don't really like that idea, who knows. Case notes for file 819. What if our consciousnesses can hop universes together? So there's this notion called walk-in, which is where your soul departs your own body and a different soul enters in. And it may not always be related to quantum immortality. In fact, this is unrelated because it's someone else's soul not your own going into another copy of yourself in a different universe. The best analogy I can think to describe this is like you're playing a video game, you have your character in the game, you have your controller controlling him, and then you just pass the controller over to someone else. So the character is the same, but the person controlling it is different. 
And that might be the case. Maybe the memories are no longer the same because the person isn't the same anymore. Maybe an alternate version of herself though. That is possible. It is strange though, things don't quite add up here because if you hopped universes, then why do your kids remember the same memory as you do? Your wife uh, fell from the tree and broke her arm that way. But she's saying she, she didn't and her mother as well is saying that. So there's two conflicting sets of memories and if you just hopped universes, it would just be you that would be conflicted. Not your kids as well. Unless they hopped along with you. Which I think does happen. Some event triggers death in multiple people at the same time. If they're all connected, they seem to move along in the universal highway in the same direction. Case notes for the bonus file. My cat detected an entity. I wonder how it is that cats, specifically cats, are able to peer through the veil that guards or shields different universes or dimensions. They seem to be uniquely attuned to that. You can go back into ancient Egypt, cultures from the past, they had this knowledge too. Cats have very strong senses, beyond what we could describe exactly. But even if their senses are very well attuned, I think the membrane between dimensions and universes as well must be very thin. There's not much separating us. It's very rigid, but with the right attunement in your mind, you can see it. And in some cases, cross over. Case notes for file 820. The matrimonious glitch in the matrix. So I'm gonna say, I think the closer we are to someone, perhaps related to how much time we spend next to them, the more our souls or brains and souls can become entangled in sort of like a metaphysical Wi-Fi network where we're able to actually communicate without speaking directly. Telepathically, I guess you could say. But I don't think it's magic. I think there is some sort of actual connection that we're just not able to fully detect yet. Case notes for file 821. Tourists from a parallel universe. Right, so the only mundane explanation I can offer here is that maybe this was some sort of uh, large-scale impromptu prank? Where you know in those areas, like mainly in cities, they have large groups of people that are organized and deliberately try to mind warp people or they're all just in a cafe or out in the park and they just freeze all together. You've seen that before? I've seen a few videos of that, it's pretty cool. However, if it's not related to that, then my guess is you were seeing people from another parallel universe and they were seeing you, but there was only the visual bleed through. No one was actually in each other's universes, you were just seeing each other. And obviously both confused, not quite fitting. This would explain why the cashier only checked you out and not the other two girls that were next to you. Although, the fact that they spoke a language you didn't understand. Well, maybe it was just Chinese or something, I don't know. Or maybe it was a universe that was extremely different. You know, dealing with quantum immortality, we're always dealing with universes that are pretty much the same. Minor differences, maybe moderate. Maybe Taco Bell is like Bell Taco now or something like that. Nothing huge. And I like the idea of different universes out there that are completely different from what we know. That's very fascinating to me, I would love to visit them. Case notes are file 822. Time froze, but there was a voice. So towards the end you mentioned this blue orb like UFO thing, maybe a spiritual orb, I'm not sure. Originally I was just thinking this was evidence of the simulation breaking down or some sort of um, intended pause, there was a voice. So it's almost like the server developers clicked pause for a second and then gave you the answer with their own microphone speaking into your mind. Kind of a neat idea, I think. However, now that you mention UFOs, it is conceivable that they were aliens speaking to you. Some way pausing your perception of time, not pausing time itself. And then speaking to you telepathically. There's many accounts of this happening and especially one of the most notable aspects to this is everyone reports when they're being spoken to telepathically by aliens, at least these aliens, that they feel calm and serene, not at all terrified. Even though as described, you kind of get the impression that it would be rather terrifying. Case notes for the bonus file. Spiritual lingering. Even if the entity, the spirit, isn't malicious and you get that impression, well, you're still being watched. And even if it's someone nice, you don't really want to be watched. You're doing your business in the bathroom, you're all naked, you don't want to be, you don't want some spiritual perv, you know, perving on you, stuff like that. Or just minding your own business in your room. When you feel that presence watching you, it's very disturbing. 
and I don't think there's any way around that. Case file number 823, written by OK to Decay, the Chinese master of space-time. This happened in late summer, early fall 2020. At this time, due to the world event, wearing a mask was mandatory in all indoor places. This included public transport. I, 22 female, live in the Netherlands, specifically in a relatively new city that was built completely centered around public transport. Buses depart every few minutes in all different directions to cover the entire city. No matter where you live, there's a bus stop within walking distance. It's quite difficult to commute via car when traveling from one neighborhood to another. Only the bus and bike lanes go through the neighborhoods. When traveling by car, you usually have to drive all the way around the neighborhoods. The city was built this way to limit traffic in the streets and therefore ensure safety. This is important for context later on. I worked a morning shift in the next town over, 7 in the morning to 3 p.m. After work, I took the train home and arrived in my city around 3.30. My boyfriend, 25 male, picked me up at the central station and we went to grab some takeout at our favorite Chinese slash Surinamese restaurant. We sat down in a small park and enjoyed our food outside since the weather was still pretty nice around this time of year. Around 4.30, a mutual friend, 22 male, of ours, arrived at the central station. He joined us until my boyfriend and I decided to go home around 5.30. Our friend decided to go home as well, and we all walked towards the central station to catch the bus. All of us needed to get into the same bus as our friend's home is on the same route, just a few stops earlier than ours. We got into the bus and sat down on the back seat, four seats next to each other. I sat in the seat next to the window, my boyfriend sat next to me, and our friend sat in the seat next to the door, leaving one seat between my boyfriend and him. The bus got busy pretty quickly, since rush hour had started. The seat in front of me, facing me, not facing forward, stayed empty. Kind of odd since some people were standing due to no more seats being available. At the very last moment, a man stepped into the bus and sat down in that seat. He had a bag with Chinese slash Surinamese takeout from the exact restaurant my boyfriend and I went to earlier that day. I pointed it out to him and we joked about the coincidence since it's a pretty unknown restaurant and slightly hidden in a side street. The man was pretty recognizable, red plate button up, worn down shoes, dark blue jeans, a blue cap, and he wore his mask inside out and upside down. The bus departed and suddenly my allergies started acting up horribly. This was before I had been to the hospital, and I wasn't on medication yet. I was used to allergy flare-ups, but not so randomly. I felt my nose running under my mask, and I didn't have any tissues with me. I wanted to use my sleeve so badly, but I figured that was disgusting, especially since someone was facing me. From this point forward, my focus was completely on the man in front of me, and hoping he would get off so I could wipe my nose. He eventually got off. Our mutual friend had gotten off to stop before him. I wiped my nose and my allergy flare-up started disappearing as fast as it had appeared. My boyfriend and I started casually chatting while the bus continued on its route. It was driving very fast. Chauffeurs often do this so they arrive at the stations, mainly bus stops where they have to wait until the planned departure time to leave, early, and as a result they can have a quick smoking break. The bus got to one of the main bus stops and the chauffeur got off to smoke. He got there five minutes early. The same man that had gotten off earlier was waiting at the bus stop and stepped into the bus again, sat down in the same seat across from me, mask upside down and inside out, looked like he hadn't even taken it off, and the takeout bag on his lap. He looked at me and I looked at him. I felt shivers all over my body. My allergies started flaring up again. I looked away and stayed like that until my boyfriend and I got to our stop. We quickly left the bus. The man stayed inside the bus as it continued on its route. Both my boyfriend and I were absolutely spooked and couldn't figure out how that was possible. We went over all the possibilities, but nothing added up. This man couldn't have been there. It's impossible. He got off that bus. There's no way he could have made it to that stop before our bus got there. There's no car, no motorbike, nothing could have gotten there before that bus did. And yet, he was calmly waiting at the bus stop taking food from the city center in his hand. Creepy file number 58, written by Don't Take Me Lightly, 
you who from the darkness. This happened two nights ago. I was taking my dog out to the bathroom in my backyard for the last time that night, around 1.30 a.m. I have a decent sized backyard and there aren't many street lights or light pollution around, so it was basically pitch black apart from the torch on my phone. Anyway, the dog goes to the bathroom and I tell her, good girl, let's go inside. And instantly I hear someone call, yoo-hoo, out from somewhere I couldn't see. It sounded like they were just at the fence line, fairly close to where I was, maybe 10 meters away. It was definitely a person, not an animal sound. They didn't scream it loud or even shout it very loudly, just called it out sort of creepily and it was obviously directed towards me. I nearly crapped my pants and my dog was super startled and started growling and barking instantly. She was looking exactly towards where it came from. Anyway, I wasn't sticking around, so I bolted inside with my dog and locked the doors. I just don't know who it was or why they did it. It was really late, there was no other light source, and I don't know who would be wandering around in the pitch black like that. I live in a very low crime neighborhood, as crime is basically unheard of. Now, every time I take my dog out for the loo, I feel like I've walked into a horror movie. Some people suggested owls, no. I know the species of owl where I live and there's very few, and they're very rare to see. None of them sound like you who in an older woman's voice. Some people suggested neighbors. I'm so close with my neighbors that I babysit their kids, look after and feed their animals, tend to their garden if they ask, etc. They would have told me if they had an old grandma that likes to walk about at night and to keep an eye out. I asked some neighbors today and no one saw, heard, knew anything that night. Although one neighbor said they'd check their cameras and if they see someone, they'll send it to me. Case file number 824, written by Red Bell Pepper. The Mysterious Case of Solar Teleportation. This anomaly, I guess is the best word to describe it, happened a few months ago. Frankly, I still have trouble believing it myself. So take this writing as me trying to come to grips with what happened and that there's no explanation I can muster that really fits. I was waking up, a normal day like any other, just earlier, groggy, getting my shower and coffee, soon to set off to work right after. Had to get to the office a little sooner than typical because of presentation prep work I still had to do. Procrastination is a nasty mental bug that I can't seem to shake. Anyways, set off driving, heading in. Usual commute is maybe 30 minutes, but it's earlier now, 7 a.m. Less traffic, so I figured I could make it a few minutes earlier. This was a few months ago, summertime. The sun was already rising. Get on the highway and I'm off. Only I had this feeling in the pit of my stomach as soon as I got on the highway. I couldn't place it exactly. Everything looked normal, but I knew it wasn't. Almost like the people who are in their deathbeds and know when they're about to die, I think it's an actual medical symptom, a sense of overwhelming dread. That'd be the closest way I could describe it. By the way, I'm 34 and in pretty good shape, so I don't think this was an actual medical issue. I'm driving along the highway. I notice the sun move on the horizon a little in my periphery. It wasn't dramatic, and I'm of course not looking directly at the sun for obvious reasons, but it did flow ever so slightly. For some reason, when my brain registered this, I just felt ill, seriously sick, had to pull into the shoulder and get out, puke. Eventually, I calmed down and actually started to feel positively elated. It was a wild roller coaster of a morning, let's say. But when I get back into the car and quickly check my phone, I realize there's 45 minutes of unaccounted time, if not a few minutes more. I expected to make the trip to work by 7.25 a.m. at the latest. Yet, I'm still 15 plus minutes out and it's somehow past 8 p.m. This is impossible to an infinite degree. I sat there, just staring at my phone, not able to process this. The rest of the commute, which I started back minutes later because I was stunned, was fine. Nothing else weird has happened to me since. I spent the whole day and many days since trying to logically explain this. Only thing I can think is, somehow I blacked out and went on autopilot, pulled onto the shoulder for over 45 minutes, sat there doing nothing, then went back to driving and my consciousness returned. Why the hell would that happen? 
I did see a doctor a couple weeks after this and told him I had a memory lapse. They conducted various tests but found nothing wrong. My brain is in tip-top shape as is my heart, as far as they can tell. Bonus File Written by Snoo Suggestions 9830 The House That Costs More Than Money Friend invited me to the second viewing of the apartment they were interested in buying. The apartment itself was great, but it came with a room which was part of the attic which the realtor said was used by the residents as a meeting room. She took us up to show the room and it was odd. It was a bedroom sized room with no windows and no source of light as the light fixture on the ceiling was broken. We had to use a light from our phone as a flashlight. All that was in the room was an old cupboard which had half glass doors with a green velvet looking curtain behind them and some chairs in a corner. When the realtor was out of earshot, I turned to my friend and said, oh my god, this is like something from a horror movie, where the residents of the building are in a cult, what the hell is in that cupboard? My friend laughed and repeated what I said back to the realtor when she returned. The realtor herself then confessed that she also thought it was creepy. I asked out of curiosity what's in the cupboard, and she said it's locked so she doesn't know, but she agreed with me that it looks like an altar or something creepy. My friend still loves the place. It had a nice vibe otherwise. I just saw that room was very strange to have resident meetings in. Creepy File Number 59 Written by Ruga Ru 2217 My friend was a murderer. I remembered this event after reading a similar creepy story on here and thought I'd post it. I went to school with this guy. We never dated or anything like that, just friends, but not overly close. I didn't see him for a few years after we got out of school, but we ran into each other when I was pregnant with my son. We hugged, talked for a while, and then went our separate ways. Several years later, I was watching the evening news and I heard them say a familiar name. I immediately recognized the name of my old friend since it was fairly unusual. They said he was arrested for killing his girlfriend. He apparently stalked her but was able to get her to come to his apartment to get her belongings. He then abducted and shot her. He drove around with her body in the car for four days. I don't mean that the body was in the trunk either. Her body was in the passenger seat and he would talk to her and take her places, such as visiting his father's grave. I was even able to find the article from 1991. Bonus File, written by Miss Jellybean the Ethereal Intruders I, 25 female, live alone in a one-bedroom flat. My bedroom is on the top floor. Kitchen, living room, and bathroom are down a flight of stairs. The front door is down another flight of stairs. A couple months ago, I woke up, went on my phone for a bit, and then decided to get up. Before I moved to get up, I heard three distinct, clear knocks on my closed bedroom door. I remembered that the estate agent said that I was due to have an inspection soon, and assumed it was them. I couldn't be bothered to deal with them, and found it weird that they just let themselves in without ringing or anything, so I pretended to be asleep and didn't respond. I waited, no more knocks, but I also didn't hear anyone walking away down the stairs, and I didn't hear anyone entering or leaving my flat. As I was lying there, waiting for them to leave, I realized that I had locked myself out several months ago, had to have the lock replaced, and hadn't gotten around to taking a set of the new keys to the estate agents. I was obviously very freaked out at that point. How did these people get in? I forced myself to get up after a while, I really needed to pee, and no one else was in my flat. I've asked friends and family and they were all as freaked out and confused as I was. Anyone else have any explanations? Because I'm stumped. File number 825, written by Nick Captain, the Transdimensional Debit Card. I went on a business trip up country a couple weeks back. En route, I went through a toll gate and used my company card to pay at the booth. The teller handed back my card and paper receipt, which I placed in the center console. A couple hours later, I stopped to get a coffee and take a break. When I looked in the console, my card was gone and I could only find the paper slip. I searched for the card but had no luck. Thinking I may have left the card at the toll booth or it had somehow fallen out of a pocket somewhere along the way, 
I called the bank and put a temporary hold on the card. When I got to my destination, I unpacked and searched the car, thoroughly. Under seats, carpets, every nook and cranny. Still nothing. So, I called the bank again, ordered a new card which was delivered a couple days later, changed all my app settings to the new card number. A lot of admin work and return debit orders later, everything is sorted out and up to date. Exactly a week later to the day, I'm driving along the highway alone. I glance down at the console, and there is my lost card, in broad daylight, in exactly the position I put it, with the paper slip from the toll booth. Bonus file, written by Chelly Bean 2016. My memoirs of horror from my childhood home. This happened years ago, but I remember everything clearly, and every time I think or talk about it, the feelings come back. When I was eight, my mom and stepdad moved us to a country home. I have two younger siblings as well, so there were five of us that lived there. This house was always a little creepy, but it held so much more than just a creepy feeling. I've been able to see things from a very young age. I don't talk much about it because honestly, you always get mixed feelings, so I avoid it. Anyway, when we first moved in, I kept seeing a little boy. He was always in my little brother's room or the kitchen and he cried a lot, all of the time. I was eight, so I didn't really know why, but I always tried to ask what was wrong. He didn't talk back. I kept telling my mom that a little boy in the kitchen kept waking me up at night, but she never believed me. For a few years, it was just a little boy, but that all changed very, very quickly. Right before my mom and stepdad divorced, they fought all the time. The environment in the house definitely felt hostile, and then he moved out and things went downhill fast. At first, it was just a few extras I'd see at night usually roaming our L-shaped hallway. Then, weird things started happening. I've never been a great sleeper, so I'd always be awake at night. I'd watch my door open and close by itself. I'd hear banging all throughout the hallway. And when I had to go do laundry in the back room that also housed the entrance to the basement, I'd instantly get a heavy feeling. I went down one time. I got to the second step up from the bottom and took a look around. I saw people chained to the walls, staring at me. I literally ran so fast. I cried and tried to tell my mom, but she told me I was lying. I wasn't. She started believing after she had her own scary encounter, but I'm not sure she'd want me to share it. Anyways, things kept progressing. We couldn't keep a light bulb in the light fixture in the dining room because as soon as we'd change it, the ball would literally explode, leaving shards of glass all over the floor. I watched a kitchen chair fly across the room, slamming so hard against the wall it left a hole there. We had a lamp in the living room that fell over every single night at the same time. Towards the end of our time there, we slept in the living room with the fireplace on because my mom couldn't afford propane. We had a blanket over the doorway, and when it was open because someone went to the bathroom, I'd see a lady in white on the dining room floor. She said one sentence and I'll never forget it. He's coming. She'd repeat it until she had disappeared. My theory is that she was giving us a warning about the demon that paid us a visit every night. He was evil. He was definitely set on making us leave or hurting us. He made his presence well known. Tormenting us was his favorite activity. We always went down the long hallways in pairs after things started getting bad. The one time I didn't take someone, I ended up with scratch marks. Nothing followed us when we moved though. Which is amazing, but I'm very thankful for it. Only one person has lived in that house since we left years ago. He lasted six months before he called it quits. It stands empty now, at the end of the long driveway. I've been back once. It wasn't a pleasant experience. The house is starting to cave in. I'm sure the farmer will tear it down and connect all his fields, finally. I do have one more piece of information that I love to share about it. When I did research, I found out the ground the house stood on was at one point an Indian burial ground. Later, the point or hill became home to a courthouse for a little town and they did in fact use the basement as a jail and they did chain people to the walls. 
The town died out and a family bought the ground, tearing down the courthouse and building a house over the basement. The house burned down, killing the family which included a young boy, and the house that we lived in was constructed in the same spot. Here's some more details on my childhood home. First up, my mom's experience. I will share it. Before we all moved into the living room, her room was at the very end of the hallway and the bathroom was in between us. It was a normal night, typical lamp falling and door slamming. Eventually, I was able to close my eyes. About an hour later, I was startled awake and I knew instantly something was wrong. I got out of bed and went straight to my mom's room. She was flat on her back in her bed, with her arms crossed against her chest, and I could tell she was trying to scream. I ran to her bed and all of a sudden it's like whatever had a hold of her vanished because she just went limp. She sat up and started screaming. I was scared for her. She ended up sleeping with my sister and I that night in our bedroom. We didn't talk about that night again until just a year or so ago and she described in detail what happened. She said she was sleeping and then she woke up out of a dead sleep staring straight at the ceiling. My mom never sleeps on her back. She physically can't. She was confused and tried to move but she said it felt like she was being held down by some force. She said she couldn't breathe or talk or even scream. She said that it felt like a pair of hands wrapped around her neck and just started squeezing. When I walked in and ran to her, whatever it was let her go. The last thing she saw before she could finally move was a shadow face floating up into the ceiling. She never slept in that room again. She actually moved her bed into my room instead. When the spirit was present, the house was very heavy. Most of the others that occupied the place were quiet when he was there. His constant torture was enough to drive us insane. He was the cause of most everything that happened. I'm sure he's the one who scratched me. Being alone in the house was a no-no. If you were the only one there, he would do everything in his power to show his presence. One evening, my mom had a 4th of July party. Literally everyone was outside. It was late, but everyone was still good with hanging out around the fire. I made the mistake of going inside by myself. Had I known that not a single person was in there, I would have stayed outside. I went into the kitchen to get a drink. As I was standing there, about to open the fridge, the cabinet that held the plates slammed open. I knew I needed to get out, but I was frozen. The next thing I knew, my mom's glass plates were flying directly towards me. I got hit by several before I snapped back into my reality and got out of there. I never told my mom what truly happened, I just said I broke the plates. Another time, my brother and I were playing hide and seek. It was my turn to count, so I stayed in the living room. Once time was up, I started looking. He had to be in the house, that was the rule. I searched everywhere, high and low. The last place I looked was the laundry room. When I entered, I heard my brother crying. I tried to find him, but I couldn't, which meant the last place for him to be was the basement. I walked over to the door and it was closed. We never closed that door, just because it was so hard to get open. I struggled, but finally I got it. My brother came bolting up the stairs, crying like someone had tried to hurt him. Here's what he told me happened. He had gone into the basement only to have the door slam shut behind him. He was at the bottom of the stairs and he swore that a black shadow was running down them trying to get him. He said he backed himself into the corner, apparently. He started hearing a voice say he was going to die. He didn't know what to do so he cried and that's when I opened the door. He said the shadow vanished. I believe with everything in me that one of us would have ended up seriously injured or worse if we had stayed in the house. Towards the end, I felt like he had a hold on all of us. Our moods and personalities began to take shape as very angry people. I'm sure his energy caused that. A couple days before we moved out, we were all asleep in the living room. The TV was on and so was the light, so it wasn't completely dark. I woke up to something whispering in my ear. All I could make out was run. Then suddenly there was a loud crashing sound, like glass had been broken. It was so loud everyone else sat straight up out of their beds. 
we were all trying to figure out what happened. Eventually, we all decided we needed to go walk to the bathroom and take turns with the other three standing guard. When we got to the beginning of the hallway, my mom flipped on the light. We all stopped dead in our tracks. Every single picture that my mom had hung on the wall in the hallway was on the ground. There was glass everywhere. None of us could move. We stood there forever trying to decide what to do. That was our final straw. We decided to get the heck out of there. My mom took a couple days off work to pack the house while we were at school. She ended up leaving the house in the middle of that day and didn't come back until we were with her to finish packing. She was sitting on the living room floor, packing all the DVDs into a box. All of a sudden, her phone started playing the scary, I see you, sound. She immediately got up because she knew that someone was calling her. When she picked up the phone and said hello, the only response she got was heavy breathing. She quickly hung up and tried to pack some more, but it kept happening. She actually ended up smashing that phone because she was in panic mode. She grabbed her stuff and left. We never stayed in that house again. Once we got out of there and adjusted to normal life, we felt lighter. It literally felt like a weight was lifted off our shoulder. Our family had been helping us to get our stuff out. Once the last load was out, the electricity was shut off. My uncle decided he wanted the air conditioner, so he went out to get it and he said he pulled around back to the laundry room door. When he got there, he said the laundry room door was open. He walked slowly towards it. When he made it almost in the house, he realized the basement door was fully open and the light in the basement was on. He realized that the light being on wasn't possible and he booked it out of there. The air conditioners were never recovered. To this day, my sister and I are the only ones that have dared to step foot on the property. Neither of us were alone when we did. My family doesn't talk about it anymore. It's better that way. Case file number 826, written by Agnostos Theos Logos. The Mysterious Case of Lost Chai. I had a pumpkin chai ice latte at the cafe. Ordered a second one. Don't judge me and poured what was left of the first one on top. Got in the car, drove to the pizza place, got pizza, and went home. Got out of the freaking car, put my freaking drink on top of the box while I keyed into the house, went inside and put the pizza on the TV tray by the chair. Sat down, opened the pizza box to have a slice. Instantly, looked for the spilled chai. No chai. Cleaned the whole damn house, the car, checked the ring camera, Sure enough, it's on the pizza box when I went in. It's not on the ground outside, inside, under the car, in or on top of the car, in the house, the fridge, the freezer, or in any of the trash cans. I'm so freaking bitter. It's like I forgot the chai was on top of the box when I opened it, and then it was just gone as I did. I can't explain it. It's nowhere. Case file number 827. Written by Nemesis824. Pickup truck vanished before my eyes. This morning, I was taking my usual route to work, which consists of roughly 50 miles urban and freeway driving. Approaching the end of the urban area, there is a light and a T-shaped intersection. Imagine I'm driving to the stoplight, coming from the downside of the T. Red light, three cars in front of me, mind you. There are two lanes, one dark red BMW, one dark blue minivan, and a white pickup truck. The white pickup truck was stopped behind the blue minivan. The driver's turn signal was set to the right. It was such an odd choice since you can only go left there. I turned to my mother to tell her how she shouldn't drive. She asked what I meant. I tell her, look, the white truck is doing an illegal turn, which is dangerous and stupid to say the least. She asks again, what white truck? I turn around just as I'm approaching the stoplight. Now, there are only two cars the red BMW and the blue van. We look around. Nothing. If he did overtake and sped off from a light, we would still be able to fully see him for about a mile. Take into consideration all this happens in the span of two seconds. No vehicle could pull this off. Doesn't matter if it's a million horsepower. Just baffles my mind. Creepy File Number 60 Written by Kaylin7 Chopped Meat 
My family owns a boutique store in a very big city here in the south. Our boutique is located in a very wealthy neighborhood, but that doesn't say much. If you go not even a mile north, south, west or east, you'll enter rough areas of the city. With that being said, we have a lot of homeless, drug addicts and sketchy people in general coming into our stores. When these people come in, we are also nice, respectful and treat them just like we would our normal customers. We try not to judge by their appearances. However, we don't tolerate begging, stealing or soliciting. So we've all had our share of weird encounters at our store. However, I think my most recent encounter was the creepiest. Last week, getting ready to close, I was tidying up the store when a woman came in. I greeted her as normal and everything seemed smooth sailing. She was looking around and engaging in conversation about some of our pieces when all of a sudden things changed quickly. The vibe and feeling of the room just felt eerie, so I moved behind the counter just to create a barrier. She began by grabbing one of our candles that had the saying, I love you to the moon and back, across the front of it. I think this is what originally triggered her. She began talking about her family, how she would read the book, I love you to the moon and back, to her triplets that she didn't know she even had. She then started telling me about her life being married to Ryan Gosling and how she recently killed him because he kept poisoning her and hiding her three sets of triplets and daughter from her. At this point I was just listening, I didn't want to upset her any more than she already was. When she finished, she began walking the store again, telling me about how she just got out of jail for stabbing someone, and at this point she gets about 4 feet away from the counter and tilts her head, looks me in the eyes and says, I really feel like chopping you up right now. We were the only two in the store at the time and I was in shock. I had no clue what was about to happen, up until then she was just rambling. This was the first instance of her showing aggression. Luckily, seconds after that statement, another customer, one of my regulars, came in and the woman, who just told me she wanted to chop me up, grabbed her stuff and walked out of the door. My regular could feel the tension as I rushed behind her and locked us in the store. So, to the lady who wants to chop me up, let's not meet ever again. Creepy File Number 61 Written by Significant Swan 159 Never Open the Door The twins, 14 years old, and I went to bed a while ago. I'm still recovering from an infection so I fell asleep very quickly and I probably was not entirely as quick thinking as usual. About half an hour ago I woke up because someone was knocking on my front door. I came down and, first mistake, opened the front door. A young man was there asking about someone called James. My youngest brother is called James so this confused me at first, but James has never lived here. I tried to tell him he had got the wrong address. He carried on talking and it was clear he wasn't talking about my brother. I told him again that he had the wrong address and he became quite aggressive. He said I was lying and then he asked me to let him in so that he could charge his phone and then I will show you I'm at the right house. I tried to close the door and he blocked it with his foot. After a brief struggle, I managed to get the door shut. When I closed the door, he carried on knocking for a while and started yelling that he wasn't a scumbag and I was treating him like a scumbag. He wasn't going to hurt me, he just wanted to charge his phone. Eventually, he went away but I am really shaken up and I'm feeling really vulnerable. I am lucky because we have great neighbors and I know if they heard something they would come running, but they clearly didn't hear this. How can I feel secure when there's only me and the kids in the house? We are taking self-defense classes, but I am very aware that tonight could have ended very differently if he had gotten into my house. My neighbors, both male, retired dad and his 19-year-old construction worker son, both built like brick crap houses, have just found two lads hiding in their back garden. As soon as they were found, they ran for it. Son grabbed one of them and now they're waiting for the police. Their garden shares a fence with my garden. I don't recognize a lad who's been grabbed but it's possible that his accomplice is the guy who tried to get in last night or it may be completely coincidental. Neighbor's son has a high-end motorbike that is very desirable and parked in the back garden for that reason. Be vigilant people, I will definitely be hiking up some security and I will never open the door again unless I know who it is because I opened the door tonight when I heard a neighbor say my name. 
Case file number 828, written by Becky Louise 1. Traveling at the speed of glitches. This happened a few years ago, and it's only because I've, 30 female, found myself here on the sub that I've remembered it. The weirdest thing happened to me and my 26 male boyfriend one night. So for a little context, I'll just say I live pretty close to a motorway and there's this one huge roundabout just off of it that you can take to get to a couple destinations called Ainley Top. Anyway, it's a big roundabout with three lanes and five exits. The exit that takes us in the direction to my house is the second one as you come off the motorway and it's distinct because it's the only exit on this roundabout where you have to go under a bridge and it's all lit up. This roundabout is always busy because it separates two towns. Here's what happened, and it all happened quite fast. We came off the motorway, and it was about an hour or so after rush hour, so it wasn't super busy, but it wasn't dead either. So we're driving towards the roundabout in the right lane of two lanes, and we need to move to the left in order to be able to get onto the left lane of the roundabout and exit at the correct point. As we're about to switch lanes, another car that is the same as ours, significant or not, cuts us up and we end up missing the exit. So I'm like, oh for crying out loud, we're gonna have to go all the way back around now. This was annoying because I needed to wee. But hey ho, so we start to drive around again and reach the lights at the third exit of the roundabout, which are red, so we wait. When they turn green, we set off and then the weirdest thing happened. Just as quickly as we blinked, we were driving down the exit we were originally supposed to take. We were coming out of the other end of the bridge with the lights. Absolutely impossible because we'd missed that exit and we needed to do a whole other loop of the roundabout to get back to it again. Not to mention the fact that the exit road itself is quite lengthy before you reach the bridge. I use this roundabout multiple times a week. I know it like the back of my hand and I've lived in this town all my life. At first I thought it might just have been me being tired and not concentrating, but I looked at my boyfriend and his face was just like, what the hell? I said, did you just see that happen as well? And he was like, yeah, what the heck just happened? Absolutely no explanation for it at all, and we were just weirded out for the rest of the night. We were totally sober. I was a little tired, but absolutely lucid like normal. So weird. Creepy file number 62, written by Robotic Arrow, the meow of terror. It was around 12 a.m. I was home alone and sitting on the couch reading, by TV light, which is not good lighting by the way, struggling to fall asleep. Our couch rests up against a window with shutters that basically remain closed to keep the house cool. While I was reading, I heard a slightly playful sounding meow. I froze for a moment, I wasn't sure if I heard correctly. It was bizarre and it was a very clear human saying meow. I remained frozen and about two minutes later another booming meow came from behind me again. The window was not open, the shutters were also closed but the voice was right behind me. A chill went through my body starting at the base of my neck and I sank down further into the couch until I basically melted into the floor and hid down in front of the couch. I laid along the inside lining so I couldn't be seen from any cracks in the shutters or through the huge backyard sliding glass door. I remained in that position until morning. I didn't move, I just laid there staring into the dark house, hoping that I'd never hear that meow again. Nobody ever confessed to doing this, but to this day it freaks me out. I'm afraid of dark backyards at night. I always sleep with the backlight on now. Case file number 829, written by Prince Peach 007. An entire neighborhood spawned from nowhere. I live in a rural area and there's a super long back road that connects the two parts of town. Normally you get to the midway point and you can't go straight anymore, you must take a 90 degree turn to continue. Now if you didn't turn, you would run into one of those huge swinging metal gates with a field behind it. Well yesterday, I had to give my 21 year old nephew a drive to his doctor's appointment and I used the GPS system. We turn onto the long road and then start down it. The GPS says, in 100 feet, turn left. We both say, what the hell? And he is saying, 
you gotta get that thing fixed. <laughs> and we're laughing. Well, we arrived at the section and there was a left turn now, where before there had been a field. There was a whole neighborhood down there. Now we are both quiet and he says, Yo, like how and when did this get here? We drive that road every day. I even asked my husband and he laughed at me saying, There's no left turn. I went back today and it's still there. Case file number 830, written by Chells182. The Cigarette Anomaly My boyfriend and I stopped at a gas station earlier before heading to his father's for dinner. I was running in to get myself a drink and he asked if I would grab him a pack of cigarettes. I specifically got him a cheaper brand than what he buys himself. I got the shorts because he likes to taste better than the 100s for this specific brand. We get to his dad's, eat dinner, he wants to go outside to smoke. I grab the new pack from my purse and hand it to him. He unpacks it, rips the cellophane, tears off the little shiny paper inside and throws it out, and we go out to the porch and he smokes. About an hour later, we got into the car to go home. He pulls out a pack of cigarettes from his coat pocket, packs it, opens it and says, Wait a minute, where's the open pack? You grab me two packs? Well, I most certainly did not grab him two packs. The pack he opened in the car is the exact same cigarettes he opened inside an hour earlier. No idea how this happened. I thought maybe he had just forgotten that he got himself a pack earlier, but it's not even the same brand he buys for himself. His father doesn't smoke, so he would have certainly noticed if we left it there. I was expecting to find a second pack in my purse or in his coat, but so far none have showed up. Also, I know smoking is gross, so spare me the criticism. I've quit entirely and he's cut back by half his daily intake. Something to be proud of. Case notes for file 823. The Chinese master of space-time. So we know that inanimate objects like, you know, spoons or tennis balls or towel rods, they can vanish and reappear. Phase in and out of our dimension, I suppose. Can people as well? There have been a few stories reported of this. The most prominent one I remember reading myself is there was this kid that went down a water slide, one of those that are fully enclosed so you can't see the person going down it when they're inside, from the outside, and the kid didn't re-emerge until like 15 to 20 minutes later, and other people were going down the slide too. Uh, whoever was in charge at the top just didn't think anything was wrong until later on he remembered. So he physically wasn't there anymore until he reappeared. Maybe something similar happened here? This man, the Chinese master of space-time, <laughs> phased out, was moved forward in space, and then re-emerged at that bus stop. Although I'm, I'm sure if that happened to him, he must have been confused out of his mind. It all makes some sense though, physically. Outside of a soul, if we have one, we're all just matter, excitations in the various fields of the universe. If an inanimate object can be moved or phased out, Stands to reason that we could be too. Or, the man didn't phase out, he was duplicated. That could be a possible way to explain doppelgangers too. Although I think there's a separate side to that as well because often people report feeling uneasy around a doppelganger. In this case, you know, it seemed like he was just a normal man, just a copy of him. The other unlikely but possible explanation is that these were identical twins playing a prank. I've seen some videos of this happening though usually not so elaborate and separated by great distances. But yeah, if you have an identical twin and you dress the same, have the same takeout, you could give people a lot of uh, mind warped events, that's for sure. So it could have been just something as simple as that. Case notes for the creepy file number 58. Yoo-hoo from the darkness. So I'm just trying to put myself in your shoes. <laughs> what would I do if I heard while walking my dog in the darkness? Yoo-hoo. Uh, I would be freaked out. So I think we share that and I would have bolted inside. So I guess I would have done the exact same thing. I don't know. I don't know if I'd assume it's supernatural and it might not be. It might just be some really twisted, messed up person just playing a prank. It's not really a prank in this case. This is a, a bit too terrifying. Case notes for file 824. The mysterious case of solar teleportation. So I was fixated on the small point that you mentioned uh, about the sun flowing, sort of like moving ever so slightly, but in a way that shouldn't be possible. Obviously the sun does move across the sky, but very, very slowly throughout the day. I think that's the point. And when you saw the sun flow, 
That was the 45 or 50 minute time gap that you hopped through. It is possible, as you explained it, that maybe somehow you blacked out, were on the side of the road, and just waiting, and then your consciousness came back and then brought you back to, uh, to driving. And then uh, you notice the sun was a bit further ahead in its natural movement than it should have been. I think that was the moment where it signifies the time jump. Now, if you didn't black out, it could be one, another one of those cases of space-time anomalies while driving, and you say there wasn't much traffic, so maybe this only happened to you. You uh, entered some sort of space-time warp anomaly, wormhole, and you didn't hop forward in space, only time. Although it's even more mysterious when you mention that you felt uneasy as soon as you got on the highway, so presumably before you entered this anomaly. Was your subconscious able to detect this anomaly ahead of time? Huh. If time is buffered, then maybe our subconscious is all wired into everything that's happening. The subconscious is just, well not just, but we're, we're picking up on a lot that's going on, including the future, because it's buffered. And your subconscious knew you're going to go through something very, very weird right up ahead. Maybe. Pretty cool. Case notes for the bonus file. A house that costs more than money. So how this is playing out in my mind. You buy the house, sign the papers, finalize the transaction, and then realize, oh boy, you bought the house for more than just money. Maybe your soul was involved as well. Your friend's soul. If people really do worship the devil or the occult, uh, demons, anything that's unknown, does that actually result in manifestations of pure evil in that environment? Although as you describe it, you were just creeped out in that room, but generally the vibe of the house was positive. If there is some sort of evil malevolent force, a demon, a devil, it doesn't seem like you'd get the impression that everything was copacetic, besides in that one room that was just a bit off. Maybe just weird people that had a slightly unsettling room for whatever reason. Case notes for the creepy file number 59. My friend was a murderer. They say that you can never truly know another human being. You can connect with them generally on the surface. Maybe you can dig a couple inches deeper into their psyche. But ultimately, no one knows what everyone else is thinking. No one is in their mind, examining every thought, peering through the processes by which we end up making choices. That you knew this friend would be very unsettling, because presumably you didn't assume he was a murderer or capable of that. Part of the story, right? We don't even know ourselves entirely. We don't know what we're going to do in a, a day from now, or a week, or a month, or ten years. Will most of us become murderers? No, I expect not. I hope not. Until we're faced with challenges, until we're faced with all the minutia of life, we don't really know what we're going to do. We can only try to imagine. Place ourselves in solid foundations of morality. It's the only real pathway, in my opinion. Then you have a proper guide. If you're going at it without any guide, <laughs> that's going to lead you astray. In the end, I think the best choice is just to ask yourself, how would I feel if someone else acted the same way that I'm acting now? Or might act, want to act. And then if you think, yeah, I'd be fine with that. Seems reasonable to go through with it. But if you think, oh, I would hate that. You know, put yourself in their shoes. Maybe don't do it then. Pretty sure someone wouldn't want to be murdered. <laughs> Case notes for the bonus file. The Ethereal Intruders. So, if these were entities, or monsters, I wonder if the knocking at the door was sort of the lore of crossing the threshold, where these monsters, entities, malevolent forces typically need permission to enter the body, or to, to cross into the home. Maybe in this case, the home was your bedroom, or considered your bedroom. So, because you didn't answer, they couldn't come in, and they just left and went somewhere else. It is an interesting and perhaps comforting thought. That you can only suffer evil if you allow it into your life. And if you simply say, I reject you, then it can't affect you. I don't know if that's true. Certainly not for every evil, and certainly not for humans. Human on human PvP is unlimited and unrestricted. For supernatural forces, maybe. Case notes for file 825. The Transdimensional Debit Card. Right, so this is another classic DOP event. Disappearing Object Phenomena. And seems like lately, they're all just coming back. You guys are kind of lucky, honestly. I want my tennis balls back. Still, what strikes me as very peculiar in this is that it, it always comes back in the exact same spot that it left in. Or most frequently does. It almost seems like an intent or will 
because otherwise it's the object is still bound by gravity and it's even traveling with the car itself. Even if it was bound by the Earth's gravity, the car itself isn't generating gravity to any extent that would negate the planet, so the car would still be on tethered with Earth but not the car. So how is it still connected to the car? If it's out of phase with that matter, it would just phase right through the car. For that matter, it would still be pulled by gravity and phase right through the, the ground. So there's something containing it when it's moving outside of our dimensional realm. Or it's literally not out of phase but just not rendered at all. So there's two possibilities, either it's being contained by some technology or entity in this other dimension, or the universe simply isn't rendering it, and the information is there for the position it's supposed to be in, but it's not being loaded. Case Notes for File 826 The Mysterious Case of the Lost Chai Right, so if I judge people for having too much coffee, I would be the biggest hypocrite on earth. You know, I, I live on coffee, it is what it is. Though I try to stick to just black coffee, so at least I'm not loading up on too many calories from all the cream and sugar and all that. Though that is uh, delicious, you know, a cappuccino, that's, mm, that's my mortal sin. <laughs> I especially love this glitch because you're not depending purely on your memory. You had the ring camera system set up, so you saw yourself entering with the chai on top of the pizza box. Then you open the pizza box and there's no chai. And obviously you didn't see the container anywhere, you didn't see the cup anywhere. You clean the whole house, check the car, even though you already entered and you had the ring camera footage to know that you didn't have the coffee. That's really good, at least you're not going completely crazy, like you didn't buy the coffee at all. You did, it just vanished, which is a different form of crazy, but not really crazy. You're not crazy. <laughs> trying to make sense of it sometimes, clearly it just glitches out. Maybe it's just trying to keep us on our toes. Let's go with that. Staking our fish, our bacon, now our coffee. I don't know what to do. Seems like we have to go to war with the universe. Or the extra-dimensional entities taking our stuff. Hmm. Case notes for file 827. The pickup truck that vanished before my eyes. By your description, indeed even a Tesla Model S with the rocket mode enabled. Couldn't quite pull this off. I'm trying to label these types of glitches where people are seeing into another universe. Universal peering, I suppose. And in that universe, there was three cars there. The uh, BMW, the blue minivan, and the white pickup truck. Although it's weird that he had his turn signal on, turning right, even though he was on the left lane. That's just bad driving, I suppose. And, you know, that happens uh, everywhere, so that's not inconceivable. You know what it reminds me of? It's almost like the universe is losing cohesion, and we're in the beginning phases of a server merger, where if you haven't played MMOs, there's different servers that people have their characters stored on and they play on those realms. But sometimes uh, the population decreases. To balance that out, so those players can still play with other people, they merge servers. They'll have a low population server merge with a higher one or a medium one. Sometimes even multiple servers merging together. And it kind of feels like that happens often in the universe. The multiverse, I should say. Not population dependent, but maybe iteration dependent. Maybe we're too similar to other copies, so there's no reason for us to exist, so they're being merged back in. Case notes for file 828, traveling at the speed of glitches. Probably a classic case of quantum immortality but in a duo sense, which plenty of stories of that happening now. People dying and then being transposed to a new universe but with the person they were next to. I don't know if the limitation or the requirement is simply that you die next to each other, like in physical space in that universe, or that you're connected in some more emotional or familial way, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. There's just so many bad drivers these days. I mean, I don't even drive personally, but I know I just walk around and bike around sometimes and <laughs> the amount of people that just don't care or don't notice you, it's kind of baffling. You're driving tons of metal at extremely high speeds. Probably want to pay attention, right? I think people lose sight of how crazy that kind of is. Driving. Obviously important and necessary, but crazy at the same time. Probably someone ran the red light at the roundabout. I know roundabouts are supposed to be safer from the US and Canada, don't really have those here. But even at modest speeds, crashes can be fatal. That would account well for this story, I think. Case notes for file 829. An entire neighborhood spawned from nowhere. This is interesting, it's sort of quantum immortality, but Mandela effect, but your nephew does remember it that way. So unless this is another case of dual quantum immortality, you both died and now you're both in a new universe, that could explain it, but I'm not sure. That's a major difference between universes, usually they're very small. This is big league changes. 
Why did you jump to universe so far away? Maybe in all other cases, somehow, you were all dead until this universe in the great multiverse. Even if you jump a million away from the original, there's still almost infinite more. Google plexes more to choose from. I do think if we die and we are transposed to a new universe, we do follow a set path based on iterations, uh, differences between universes. The more different, the further away it is. Well, further. I mean, I don't know how it applies exactly in terms of space between universes, if you understand what I mean. The distances between iterations of the universes in the multiverse. Case okay, so notes are file 830, The Cigarette Anomaly. What's really weird about this one is, yeah, you could say, okay, he just forgot that he bought a second pack and it was just this off-brand that you bought him as well for some reason, maybe he wanted to save money. But the fact that there isn't a second pack anywhere to be found, literally is just like, the pack you bought him was reset in time to being unopened. It seems a lot of objects are just losing cohesion. They're duplicating themselves, going out of phase, reappearing, resetting in time. Something wonky is going on. Very unnerving in a sense. And yeah, even that story of the the dead pixel in space-time, just a black dot floating above this person's uh, threshold to the door or something. Uh, that's unnerving, isn't it? File number 831, written by Remote Control Raccoon. Remember that time we teleported? I was recently on call with my mother, and without prompting, she brought up this glitch. This story is about five years old now, give or take a few months. For a while, I thought maybe I had dreamed it or something, but my mom corroborated my story. I was 18 at the time, and it was my first Thanksgiving that I wasn't in school. My mom and I were taking our usual 7-hour trip up north, on holidays like this it was more like 9 hours, to our family in New Jersey for the holiday. We used to live up there, and since moving down south, we made, and still make, the trip up north about 4-5 or five times a year. Needless to say, we are abundantly familiar with the interstate. We're abundantly familiar with the entire route, to be honest. The way we always go is by taking Route 64 to 295 before getting on the interstate, the beautiful I-95. It sucks, it is always filled with traffic, so naturally the two of us leave at ungodly hours in the morning. This doesn't bug either of us, really, because we both wake up early anyway. So this trip started off like any other. We were out the door by 6.15, had our Chick-fil-A in hand by 6.30, and we were filled up on gas and on the road by 7 or so. The first part of the trip was fine. We put on music, talked about random stuff, and gossiped as mothers and daughters do. By the time we got to the 295 exit, it was still fairly early, but both of us were wide awake. She took the exit and we were set. The road looked as it always did and nothing was out of the ordinary. After a few minutes of driving though, something felt very wrong. Gone were the multiple lanes of the highway. We were now on what looked to be a country road. It cut through a cornfield and only had one lane of traffic in either direction. We were, as far as either of us could see, the only ones driving on that stretch of road. There was a little farmhouse on our right, but that's about all. My mom and I were both really taken aback because we had just been on the highway. Neither of us had noticed any exits, nor had my mom gotten off at the wrong one. We had been on 295, and then suddenly we weren't. My mom tried to rationalize it at first, saying that she probably wasn't paying attention because she had a bit of a headache forming and had just gotten off at the wrong exit. At the time, I agreed with her, but something felt very, very off and suddenly the Chick-fil-A breakfast wasn't sitting so well anymore. There weren't any signs for directions, only a few speed limit signs as we kept going. When I looked at the dashboard clock, too, only a minute or so had gone by. By the looks of it, we were in the middle of nowhere Virginia. Time to me didn't seem to match up, but I just felt weird and dizzy at that point. My mom decided to keep driving forward. I don't know why she didn't just do a U-turn so we could go back, but she's always been the one to prefer to get actual directions. We didn't have cell service either, so that may have been why. That's pretty normal for rural Virginia though. I work on a haunted farm during the Halloween season, so I'm pretty used to spotty reception. Corn stalks do not a cell tower make. Well, we kept on driving. We came to what I guess was the census-designated place's idea of a town. By this I mean there was a service station and a church. We stopped the car, they filled us up, and my mom asked for directions. 
The guys were pretty nice, your typical laid-back southerners. They did tease my mom for her New York accent, though. When we explained that we'd gotten turned around coming off 295, they looked really surprised. The younger of the two guys said that, coming from the direction we had, we were driving towards 295 North, not away from it. That really threw us for a loop. They asked if we'd ever done this trip before, if we were new to Virginia, etc. And were very shocked when we said yes, we've taken this trip many times before. We all got quiet after that, and my mom and I got back in our car and drove another 20 minutes to get back on the highway. Once we were back on route, the pit in my stomach went away. Neither of us really talked about it anymore, and we didn't mention it to our family once we got to Jersey. I've thought about this experience a lot since it happened, though. I tried to rationalize it, but the more I think about it, the weirder it gets. Sure, plenty of people make driving mistakes when they're tired, but my mom and I had both had our coffee, and we were both well rested. What really trips me up is how we were driving towards 295 and not away from it, and how far away from the exit we were on that country road. That and how little time had passed between being on the interstate and then not being on the interstate. Like I said though, I thought maybe I'd just dreamt it. I was on the phone with my mom yesterday though, and she brought it up out of nowhere. I guess she was thinking about it because we're trying to decide what to do for Thanksgiving. She asked if I remembered that time we teleported, which is a very funny way to start a conversation, but then she got serious and said that it had freaked her out. She recounted the events almost exactly how I did, except she did say there was a sign along the country road pointing towards the service station. Regardless of what actually happened, it was a bizarre and jarring experience. At least it taught me to always appreciate friendly gas station employees. Creepy file number 63, written by Nita Redesign. Videos tell a thousand words. This happened five years ago, when I was 19. I was studying in a college town and sharing an apartment with Emma. Emma was a year older than me, and even though we didn't know each other before becoming flatmates, we quickly became friends. One day, she told me she had to go to the art school where she was studying to bring home some pieces she needed to work on. She told me she could use an extra pair of hands, so I went with her. The school is located on a small square in a pedestrian zone. We went, grabbed what she needed, and left. We were heading out of the square and towards our apartment, distracted by the conversation, when Emma tapped my shoulder. I look at her and she points to our right. There's a man there. He's recording you. I turn my head and there he is, a man in his 40s, pointing at us with his cell phone. He wasn't even trying to hide it. I immediately start walking in his direction and Emma follows me close behind. I know you were recording or taking pictures of us and I want you to delete it right now, I said. He started laughing and pretending not to speak my language. Okay, no worries, I'll repeat it in English for you. Delete the damn video. He laughed again and told me he wasn't doing anything wrong. I was having none of it. My blood was boiling at this point and with the rush of adrenaline I snatched the phone out of his hand. I opened the gallery and, of course, there I was. A video mostly zoomed in on my chest area. Not that it matters, but I was wearing a top without a bra. I delete it and before me appears what seems to be a similar video of another woman. Before I have time to react, he snatches the phone again, looks at me with a grin on his face and tells me, don't worry, I have more women there. I was very shaken up, about to burst into tears and decided to just turn around and walk home with my friend. In hindsight, I know this could have ended badly for me. He could have gotten violent when I took his phone. But part of me regrets not smashing it on the ground when I had the chance. A few months after this encounter, it made it to the news that a man had been recording women on the street of my city and uploading them to questionable sites. I will always wonder if it was the same man. Case fall number 832, written by Iridescent Teen. Little boy and puppy aged 20 years and 20 seconds. I live in an apartment complex and I was walking back from picking up my package at the front office. As I was walking back, about 15 to 20 yards away from me was a small white puppy. Looked kind of like a bull terrier and a little boy chasing after it. I started walking faster towards them because I was worried that the little boy was lost or something along those lines. Anyways, as I'm walking, 
The puppy runs around a corner to where I can no longer see it, and the kid chases after it. I then hear a dog crying and whimpering, so I start running, worried that the dog and maybe even the child got hit by a car or injured in some way. As I turn the corner though, there is a full-grown man and an adult, grown white dog. I was shocked, like what the hell happened? I looked around too and there was no little boy or little white puppy around, just a full-grown man and a full-grown white dog. And no, they didn't just look smaller because it was from a distance, it wasn't that far at all, and it was a literal toddler child and a tiny puppy, it wasn't just a vision thing. I don't know what happened, but I'm still tripping about it, I feel like I should add in. I live in an on-campus college complex meant for freshmen, no children, no full-grown men that I know of, and the only way to have a dog is by filling out an emotional support animal form, but only one dog or pet is allowed. Case file number 833, written by Snow Meow 7 the strangest 13th hole in the world. My husband and I are members of a country club with two different courses. The last time we played course A was on the 5-8 and the strangest thing happened on the 13th hole. We were just teeing off when someone from the group behind approached in their cart asking if someone had lost a pitching wedge, PW, in the middle of 11 fairway. I looked at my husband assuming it was him because it certainly wasn't me. I just hit PW off a 12 t a par 3. And while yes, I did hit PW into 11 green, it would be impossible for me to then use my PW on the next hole. I'll also add that I played D1 college golf and leaving a club behind is just not something I would ever do, let alone in the middle of a fairway or on a tee box had he meant to say otherwise. As such, I say to the guy, no, it can't be me. And he says, Taylor Made 790? Taylor Made is a brand and 790 is one of their lines of irons. And holds out my PW. How is this possible? We never saw that group again for the rest of the round, which is also weird because they'd totally been on our ass. This morning, my husband and I played course A with my dad. As we pulled up to 12T, I started telling him about the unexplained PW happening from last month. He's weirded out. Once in 13 fairway, ready to hit our approaches from around 150 yards away. We can see there's a random ball on the front of the green. We get up there and I say to my dad and husband something to the effect of free ball for you, because it's gotta be a crappy ball if it got left behind on the green and the only ball I've played for the last 15 plus years is the titless Pro V1, same as above on brand and model. My dad picks up the ball and rolls it over to my feet after I finish my putt. I'm wondering why he's put some rock flit, golf slang for junky ball, in my general direction and not kept it for himself because he is known to hit range balls on the course on occasion. I am shocked to see it's actually a fairly new titless of some variety, Pro V, he says. Now at $50 a dozen, a Pro V is not a ball you casually leave on a green. Also, fellow golfers would agree, who would do this in general with any ball? But then I catch a somewhat worn off orange sharpie marking over the Pro V1 lettering and pick it up for closer inspection. This ball is my ball. I mark mine with the script SM in orange over the lettering and it is without a shadow of a doubt that this is a used ball of mine, clear as day right here on the 13th green, a month later and somehow also passed over by the groups in front of us this morning. I checked my card for that day and I made a par so I didn't hit one in the water. Even if it was found from a round prior to that, how did it end up here for me? Two things I did not lose being returned to me on the 13th hole. The first one was weird enough, but now with this today, I have no rational explanation. Also for clarity, it is golf etiquette to mark your golf ball with a sharpie, whether with your initials like me or dots or whatever you prefer for easy identification within your group and in the event you lose your ball and need to confirm it's yours. Bonus file, written by Outrageous Term, 2395, Supernatural Cleaning. I work as a janitor, which means I'm alone and working deep into the night. I clean three buildings. The last building that I clean has been giving me the creeps basically ever since I started this job. 
I've heard voices in the janitor closet closest to me twice, seen a shadow peek out of the men's restroom once, etc. The voices couldn't have been from outside because this building is in an extremely small town in the mountains. There's a field right next to it and a convenience store across the road from it. Plus, by the time I get there, it's roughly 8.30pm. Anywho, last Monday I was driving to the building and the second it came into sight I had a bad feeling. A very bad one. If it wasn't for work I would have left. I parked, clocked in, did alarm stuff and was getting all my cleaning supplies together. But the second I walked into that building, I felt very unwelcome. The entire time I was cleaning downstairs I could feel something watching me. Like the feeling you get along your shoulders or upper back. I felt this before, but it was intense. I thought it would go away once I got to cleaning upstairs like it usually does, but it just followed me. I didn't even mop or take the trash or recycle out when I was done. I set the alarm as quick as I could and got to my car. I left a message over the supply line to let my bosses know I had a bad feeling and just left the trash in the closet. I couldn't even calm down driving home. I had the light on inside my car for the majority of the ride. I thought I was crazy at first but I never, never get this feeling at the other two buildings, nor have I heard voices or seen anything there. It's just this one that's giving me the creeps. For some reason, it's especially heavy in the men's restroom. I'm thinking someone may have died there. And it's right next to the janitor's closet. It's an old building. I don't know how old, but it was around in the 70s, I know that. I just needed to vent this somewhere. It's freaking me out. Case file number 834, written by Visual Tumbleweed 24, The Mythical Ring of Power. This happened a year or so back when my husband and I were living in a rental house throughout the notable world event. A multitude of weird things happened to us there. Tons of things happened in the 18 months that we were renting the house, some of which I've written about in other threads, but this definitely feels the most glitchy. I decided to take off my jewelry one day whilst cleaning the house. I was walking into the bedroom to put my ring in its box on the bedside table, and as I was walking through the door, it dropped out of my hand to the floor. As soon as the thing hit the carpet, it was gone despite the fact that it landed on the soft carpet and settled in pretty much the exact place that it fell. It felt like as soon as I blinked it had gone. I looked everywhere, under all the furniture, across every inch of the bedroom, even checking other rooms despite knowing there was no way I had gone that far. After searching for a while, I decided to go back to cleaning, hoping that I would find it along the way and all would be well. I cleaned the house from top to bottom that day and I could safely say that the ring had completely disappeared. I was disappointed, but there was little that could be done. About two months later, we were preparing to move out and I was doing the final clean, doing pretty much the same routine every week and went into a sort of robot mode, moving around the house methodically before getting to the bedroom. Furniture from the whole house was already moved out a couple days prior. I was finishing the clean before handing the keys back to the landlord. As soon as I walked through the door, something fell, seemingly out of the sky, and bumped me on the nose before falling on the floor and settling on the carpet. It was the ring, back in the exact spot it had fallen two months prior, as though it was mere seconds ago that I had dropped it. I was so perplexed at the time that I picked up the ring and carried on cleaning, convinced that it must have been tangled in my cloth or something. However, the more I talk and think about it, the more I feel like this was a true glitch in the matrix. Although the rational side of me, my husband mostly, says that there has to be some sort of reasonable explanation. Case file number 835, written by Dwelve Deeper, the case of missing sunglasses. This happened yesterday and today as well. This morning I was in bed, my alarm went off and I hit snooze. I reached for my e-cig by my bed for that nicotine rush. I always leave it in the same spot, but I couldn't find it. Granted, I was still a bit groggy. I didn't think too much about it and went back to sleep until the snooze alarm went off again. Turned on my lamp, searched again for it. I thought I saw it for a second, gave a double take and it wasn't there. I thought it was a shadow or something that tricked my mind. I got out of bed, searched again under and around my bed. Couldn't find it. Plugged in my phone and got a new one from my desk, they're the disposable kind. Got ready for the morning, showered and all of that. 
When I was heading out of my room, I grabbed my charging phone and literally right next to it was my e-cig. I had the new one in my hand, so I knew I didn't get them mixed up. Mm, whatever, weird coincidence I guess. But yesterday, I was wearing a lot of blue, so I wanted to wear my blue aviators. I have aviators in almost every color, blue, black, red, green, yellow, and chrome. All of them fit nicely in the cases of the door pocket. Think of my car. Yesterday, I couldn't find them and noticed the case was missing. I ran back inside the house and searched around, trying to figure out why or when I would have taken them out because that's literally something I never do. I couldn't find them. I didn't think too much about it and knowing myself, I'd find them in a random spot inside the house. But this morning, I was wearing white, black, and red, so I wanted to wear my red aviators. Grabbed the case from the door pocket thing and noticed that the pocket was full with all my sunglass cases. My blue ones were there. Yesterday, I literally checked every single case in the door pocket. I labeled the cases because I have so many of them. Went through each of them just in case I mixed them up somehow. I really like to match my fit with sunglasses. <laughs> Not the craziest thing, but pretty weird double coincidences. Bonus file. Written by Representative Win965. Mischievous dad pranks us from the afterlife. So, my dad died five years ago. It was a freak car accident while he and my older brother were driving home from some sports events they'd gone to. My dad was larger than life in every sense of the word. He was six foot eight inches tall, covered in tattoos, and he had this laugh that I swear you could hear across the country. He and his twin brother, they were identical, played so many pranks on us while growing up that we just sort of got used to it. That has not changed. Only now, dear dad has the final laugh. The night of his funeral, my uncle and I were sitting together in the backyard. Uncle was telling stories about dad and some of their wild teenage years, and I remember so badly wanting to hug my dad. All of a sudden, my uncle and I hear the unmistakable sound of my dad laughing, followed by the back door slamming shut. Uncle and I stared at each other, wide-eyed, and then burst into laughter, because yeah, that's my dad for you. The door, in case you're wondering, turned out to be locked, from the inside. Uncle and I were the only ones home at the time outside of my Rottweiler, Beast, who cannot, to our knowledge, lock deadbolts. And it took us an hour for us to find the spare key. My dad liked to move our spare key around because it makes it harder for robbers to find. He's continued to prank us over the years. Our keys go missing, your phone will start blaring his favorite song at 3 in the morning out of nowhere, or you'll wake up to the sound of my dog growling that distinctive rotty rumble that he only ever used while playing with my dad. His laughter is always heard as well as the scent of Old Spice, his favorite cologne. We miss him every day, but he always manages to remind us that he gets the last laugh nowadays. Case file number 836, written by L Care SN, apartment negative 201. Both me and my girlfriend were so excited to move in together. It was our first place and we had high hopes. I remember the first time we stepped foot inside the apartment, so vividly. I have never been one to believe in the supernatural, not a ghost, energy, spirit person. That all changed in the last year I spent in our apartment. I remember opening the door to the second floor apartments, walking up on a set of stairs and turning onto the landing. As I reached the top of the second flight, I became instantly lightheaded, as if the air had become thinner and yet heavier at the same time. It was uncomfortable to say the least. I struggled with anxiety and have never had the feeling that I did there anywhere else. Normal anxiety doesn't touch the feeling you have when you are in a space that just feels wrong. The first weeks living there, I felt anxious, as if my body was telling me to leave. I felt uncomfortable putting up a mirror in our living room. I had the strangest unequivocal feeling of being scared to see something I didn't want to see in that mirror. There were constant foul smells and sounds lingering and moving through the space. I would feel drained the moment I stepped foot inside the place at the end of a day. Everything felt wrong, from the moment we moved in the energy was off. All me and my girlfriend could do was fight with one another. We had never had any animosity in the way we did in that place. 
I truly have never felt less like myself. We would see things move in the peripherals and hear what sounded like another couple arguing coming from our vents. I have more I could say, but I'm more curious if anyone has had a similar experience. Still processing everything as I just moved out a little over a month ago. Creepy File Number 64, written by Jackson1414. The Creepy Man Smiling in the Basement. For a bit of context, I work at a gas station in the backwoods of Tennessee and that's where this happened. Last night when I clocked in at 8, the store was completely dead. I figured it was going to be a pretty easy night because the road this station is on is not the main road. Actually it used to be, up until about a decade ago when a new freeway was built. This led basically every business that was here to pack up and leave their old building abandoned. Thanks to this, there are a lot of abandoned buildings on the stretch of road that local druggies tend to claim as their own. Anyways, at around 11, I only had an hour left of my shift and so I figured I should actually get some work done instead of just sitting around and doing nothing. I'm 18 and so I work the shift alone, which is nice because it means I can do pretty much whatever I want. This is normally pretty great because I can do whatever I want so long as I get what I need to get done, done. I noticed we were almost out of barbecue chips and so I need to go get them from our storage space which is for some reason in the basement of the station. I have always hated going down there just because it gives me the creeps. Why the owner decided to store everything down there is beyond my comprehension. I got about halfway down the steps before something fell on the other side of the room and it sounded like footsteps were coming my way. I sprinted up the stairs and locked the door to the basement, panicking like a madman the entire time. When I got back upstairs, I went behind the counter to the store computer so I could check the security cameras. I flicked over to the one that looked into the basement and there was this guy just standing there smiling up into the camera. The worst part, he had a look of absolute insanity in his eyes, but he didn't look like the average junkie in the area. He was clean shaven and dressed in what looked to be jeans and a button up of some kind. Honestly, if he'd walked into the store I wouldn't have batted an eye but because he was down there and because he was just looking into the camera smiling, it shook me to my core. I called the owner and at first he was pretty mad I called him in the middle of the night but once he heard how freaked out I was his tone changed. He told me he'd be there in 15 minutes then to just lock the main door to the store and make sure the man didn't go anywhere. I asked if I should call the police but for some reason he didn't want me to do that just yet. I locked the entrance to the gas station and went back to looking at the man. He was still there just smiling up at me. About 3 or so minutes later he stared at me and he walked out of view of the camera. My boss showed up soon after armed with a shotgun and when I let him in he immediately went to the basement. I went with him just because I felt safe with there being another person in there and all but we found nothing. My boss ultimately chased this up to me being tired and hallucinating the man, but I know what I saw. This has me scared crapless as I clock back into work in a few hours and I'm really dreading it. Checking back in, I'd like to say my shift yesterday went pretty normal and I have the night off tonight which is always great. I will say the owner aka my boss isn't exactly a model citizen. I don't think he's hiding anything illegal in the basement but then again, I've also never really gone looking for anything. My boss is also a bit of a jackass when it comes to phones which is why I didn't get a picture or video of the monitor. His rule is that your phone has to stay in a small drawer behind the counter for your full shift. The first time you're caught with it out you get a warning and the second time you get fired. I've already gotten caught with it once and I really don't feel like being unemployed so sorry for not getting pictures. Next, my boss did end up looking at the footage and seeing the guy. He agreed with me that it's creepy and also apologized for saying I just hallucinated it. He still doesn't want to call the cops for some reason but he did say if it happened again he would get the police involved. He went back and looked at everything that was captured up until that point but there were no signs of anyone going down there. Apparently, he asked the other people that worked there if they've ever seen anything down there but I don't know what they said. Lastly, I know some people thought the story sounded like the like to smile movie. I haven't seen that movie yet so I don't know if it's close to that or not but if it is and there's not much I can do, 
I know personally I'm not making this up. It really happened and it freaked me out. Case file number 837, written by Idule, The Secrets of My Supernatural Phone. For the context, my job is to fix lamps, and my current gig is this large warehouse with over 500 lamps to fix. This specific lamp is a LED card type of lamp, and every LED card needs to be removed and changed. It started the first time a few weeks ago, when I started to lose some of my tools and lamp parts, and later found them somewhere in the warehouse, or in my home where I absolutely did not need them and I wasn't able to travel with my work pants since I always change them in the working area and leave them there. However, this one that occurred a few days ago messed up my brain. I was coming from the local 7-Eleven store because I was on my lunch break and was normally walking from my car to the warehouse. I literally checked my girlfriend's message while walking. Then I opened the warehouse's door and went in. Then I wanted to put my work gloves to my pocket because I was about to go scroll through more of my phone. I had hands full because I had my phone, or so I thought, and food plus drink that I had bought. Then I go to my break room and poof, the phone is not anywhere. I looked the whole route and thought what the hell, it can't be on the car since I scrolled it on the outside while walking to the warehouse. Then I went to check the car and the phone wasn't there either. I started to panic since I have the newest iPhone and didn't want to lose it since it cost me half of my paycheck. Then, after using my friend's phone to find my iPhone app, it said that my phone doesn't have a location at all. Then I freaked the hell out and told my coworker that we ain't doing anything before we find the phone. <laughs> then he started to look for it in our break room. We also do the lamp fixing there so it's kinda messy because there are so many new and old parts for those lamps. I went back to the car again and somehow found the phone from the spot I looked earlier. I still can't understand how the heck, since I texted my girlfriend on the way to the warehouse and had the phone in my hand while after going in. Scariest part is that the message that I wrote while walking was sent, so how the heck did my phone teleport back to my car? Case file number 838, written by Cuddles89. Children react to father that isn't home. About 10 minutes ago, I was in the laundry room folding while my son, 4, and daughter, 23 months, watched Disney in the living room. Our front door is propped open to let fresh air in, but the security door is locked. My husband is at a friend's house getting help with a programming project, and I hear this. 4. Daddy, daddy, daddy. 23 months. Daddy, daddy. Husband's voice. Hey guys, where's mommy? 4. She's doing laundry. Husband. Oh, is she folding clothes? 4. Yeah. My 23 month old is still saying, Daddy, throughout. I finish what I'm folding and walk into the hall to see if husband wants help with dinner. Here's the thing though, he's not in the house. Okay, so maybe he went back outside to get something else from the car. With the front door propped open, the security system doesn't chime when you go in and out. I look out the door. His car isn't here. Me? Hey, Four, where did daddy go? Four scrunches a face and looks confused. Maybe he's at work? Me? Weren't you just talking to him? Four? No. I checked the security camera and it didn't catch anything. I feel like it was either a glitch or a parallel universe bled into this one for a moment. But I know my husband was here. Bonus file, written by Memphis Bassus, White Creatures in the Dead of Night. I have seen hundreds of these things at night in the woods, in the rural areas around Memphis, starting around 2020. They are tall, humanoid creatures with blacked out eyes, and they move slowly and in strange jerky movements. First time I saw them, I was visiting a veteran friend of mine who was down on his luck about midnight of Thanksgiving Day in 2020. He had been living in a run-down camper vehicle at the edge of the woods on his brother's property. Between his camper and the tree line, there was the remains of an old trailer that had been destroyed by a tornado with a street light on top of the pole that was used to run electricity to the destroyed mobile home. On the other side of the pole was approximately 15 yards of a field that an old dirt road that split it in half with tall grass and brush at the edge of the far side of the field after which the tree line started. 
I thought they were people hiding at first, as they seemed to be grouping more in the darker areas where the light from the pole was not as bright. I asked my friend about them and he shrugged it off and said that they were always there and they didn't bother him. He also told me that no matter what you did, you couldn't get close to one. So being a combat veteran with two deployments under his belt and my personal firearm from my vehicle, I attempted to approach these things. As I got closer, I noticed that they were solid white creatures with solid black eye sockets that moved in a jerky but very slow manner. There had to be 50 or more in that field, down the dirt road, and at the edge of the tree line and beyond. Determined to let something mess around and find out, I continued to walk towards them, and all of a sudden they all looked at me with black, empty-looking sockets and instantly caused me to feel more fear than I have ever remembered having in my life before. I did not approach them that night. I turned away and got out of the area and took my buddy with me to stay a few days at my place. Since that first time I saw them, I have seen them around a dozen times since. I have since tried to run and catch them and failed because the creature simply disappeared the moment I closed in within 5-10 to 10 yards and lost direct eye contact for a mere flash. It's like they can phase in and out or something. If you get in close, you can see that the weird jerky movement is parts of them. Arms, legs, heads disappearing and then reappearing in a different position. I think they disappear anytime they move, so they cannot be seen if they walk. I have pumped 45 5.56mm incendiary rounds from my AR-15 into one without a single shred of evidence of it left behind. These things do make audible noise that can be recorded, but do not show up on video from a cell phone or even on an old analog camcorder with cassette tapes. Animals also see them, however, I have tried to show them to people and only about half of those I have seen have seen them too. I have wondered if I was losing my mind and if anyone else has seen them or tried other experiments with them. I have also searched all over the internet and only found a few cryptid creatures that share one or two similar things to them, but nothing that was close enough for me to be satisfied. The only thing that was really close was the origin of white zombies, sort of. There have been a few people that have told me about this shape-shifting creature, but they don't change or bleed. They seem to be different sizes, some larger, some smaller, and they group up in what I have come to call family clusters, four to five of them, usually with two taller ones and one or two smaller ones. Case Notes File 831 Remember that time we teleported? So I read a comment in the thread that could possibly explain it, at least to some degree in that there's a carbon monoxide leak that was feeding into the cabin of the car, and that could explain the headaches, that could explain the memory loss and behaving weirdly, obviously driving away and then back towards the highway that you came from. It wouldn't entirely explain the fact that there was uh, no time gap. If there was just a memory loss issue going on here or discombobulation from the carbon monoxide poisoning, then presumably there would be a lot of time disparity going on because it would take you time to drive all the way away from the highway then turn back and drive back. But you said there was a minute gone. And it also doesn't fully explain coming back onto the highway and then the weird feeling in your gut going away and presumably nothing else happened. If there was a leak, well it would continue even after this weird anomaly while you're back on the highway. So presumably it would happen again. You'd have this weird encounter where you keep going off the highway or just being in weird spots for no reason. And I think there's some validity, especially for other glitches, but I don't quite think it fits here. Unless we combine it with a glitch where there was a gas leak, and that did account for the headache and feeling a bit weird when you got on the highway, and you both died from it, which is actually something that does happen. And you don't even really notice it. Besides the headache and feeling sleepy, you just die, because you don't have enough oxygen going to your brain. You're both transposed to a new universe, and then in that universe, for some reason, you're driving towards the highway from an off-road I don't know why you'd be coming from that direction because presumably you both live in the same area and they just took a back road for some reason in that other universe. That could explain it, I think. Case notes for the creepy file number 63. Videos tell a thousand words. Right, I mean I fully understand the rage that would rush through you. At least in the US, technically it's legal to record anyone you want. Uh, well, it depends on the state. Some states do require two uh, parties to consent. But in most places, uh, it's just presumed that there's no privacy in public. Of course, in a way that he was doing it, obviously in a provocative way and also to sell the content apparently online or something. 
But yeah, the rage I understand, and it's just very dangerous, as you mentioned in the last paragraph. You you don't know these people. I mean, they could have they could have weapons. They could uh, obviously they're mentally unstable from the get go, given what they're doing. So yeah, uh, smashing his phone probably would have ended pretty poorly for you. Just in the future, be careful and try to contain that rage because it can lead to dangerous places. Case notes for file 832. Little boy and puppy, aged 20 years and 20 seconds. So ordinarily, I would say, the little boy and the younger bull terrier probably were just scared off by some older man with a similar looking dog that's just older as well. And they were just, you know, coincidentally around the corner. But as you describe the location, being this uh, college freshman campus, where there's no old men allowed with dogs, or young children for that matter, you know, why would some toddler child be running after a dog anyways? Where are the parents? So does that mean this indeed was some sort of temporal anomaly? We have universal peering, where you're seeing into the uh, alternate universe. We have dimensional shifts, where objects disappear, vanish, go out of phase temporarily. But seeing into the future so far, well that would only be possible if each universe has its own buffered system, and it's well in advance. Maybe the whole course of the universe, or at least dozens of years ahead, is buffered. Maybe it's not just a few minutes. In that case, you are seeing a buffered version of who they're going to be in the future. Apparently the child grows up to uh, still like dogs, which is good. Dogs are good for us. Get a dog if you don't have one. And now I'm gonna go feed Mr. Ben. The strangest 13th hole in the world. Reading this, it's clear there's no duplicates, so, the items that went missing literally did go missing without you noticing, and then reappeared as you needed them. Now, I don't think you dropped them or anything like that, you're an experienced golfer, clearly. They were taken from you by some entity or the universe not allocating memory to storing the information of their existence. There's conceivable methods to this. If the universe is buffered, then the universe has that information stored. It'll know when the items are needed. Because so I think that's part of the buffering. It's not exactly a replay, it's the information stored in the replay if you're watching a movie or something. Even better in a video game where the game world itself still has to be created and loaded, but it can replay the settings and scenes just by the information given. So it's predictive loading, if that makes sense. And so that way, yeah, it knew where you are going to be, so it just loaded the object there, even though it was taken. Maybe it was taken actually, and the universe wanted to restore it, because it's important, for some reason, that you have that ball and the uh, PW, as you call it. Case notes for file 834, the mythical ring of power. Yeah, this ring was completely out of phase with all of reality. It was still bound by gravity, or... That information simply didn't exist and the universe restored it in that given moment as soon as you enter that room and it fell as it was going to initially or as it did because you did say it hit the carpet so it rewinded time a bit. But it's not really time. I think the information was stored in the universe of where it was supposed to be three or four seconds prior to what you saw and then just as you were leaving the home for probably the last time you'd ever enter that room, it reappeared. It was like some developer or GM in the real world clicked a button and said, okay, yeah, they're leaving now. This is where the ring was three or four seconds before. Initiate. Just pops in from information that was stored prior. That makes a lot of sense to me. Interesting. So in a nutshell, the ring did fall. It did go on the carpet. For some unknown reason, it glitched out and de-rendered. And then just before you left, the final time, it was made to reappear. I wonder why. Why would anyone care? Why would the developers care if these are entities taking the item? Why do they care that you have the ring back? Do they feel some sort of obligation? Moral obligation? Case notes for file 835. The case of missing sunglasses. So many disappearing object phenomena lately. And I get the impression it has to be one or the other. It's some sort of informational buffer system that's recreating it after phasing out the item for some reason. It might just be the server isn't stable, at least our universe. The other option is some sort of trickster entity or some out of phase being, which I guess is the same thing. Maybe these out of phase beings are just the echoes that we're talking about, ghosts as most would uh, describe it. And they're able to de-render objects or f just phase them into their, their dimension, which is just, it's close to ours but it's not exactly the same. So there's some bleed through if they concentrate, I guess. And it really does make some sense to me. If echoes are out there and they're out of phase with us, then presumably they could bring matter into that phased area, into the same uh, wavelength as them, 
They're able to interact, sometimes, with us, so they're able to cross over in that dimensional sense. Why not bring something back with them? Case notes for file 836. The apartment, negative 201. My impression is that this apartment somehow is tethering a lot of negative energy, probably spirits or echoes as I like to call them. People that lived and died, their essence remains, or a fragment of it. And if they were really bad people, or maybe not necessarily bad in their actions, but they held a lot of thoughts that were very unpleasant and just brought everyone down, like not just negativity in the sense of malevolence, but even just depression or, I mean, have you ever been around that person that is just so heavy on your soul that you can't, you can't bear to be there for long? Kind of like soul vampires, I guess is one way to frame it. Anyways, if a lot of people were there and died in, with that context, I think it can have a leeching effect on anyone else who goes there. You mentioned the air thinning out and yet being heavy at the same time, almost indescribable to our physical sense, and yet you know it's there. It's a kind of mixing, a blending that shouldn't be happening. I'm glad you got out. Very good call. Case notes for the creepy file number 64. The creepy man smiling from the basement. Boy, this is a really terrifying one to me, especially given that you work there at night alone. At least there's a lock on the basement door, but still. The question I had reading this is, how did the man get in and then get back out? I mean, he didn't go through the, the door that was locked, you were there, and he didn't sneak in before, uh, during opening hours, as uh, your boss reviewed the camera footage and no one went down there. So there must be some sort of secret passageway down there that's kind of cool and weird at the same time. Maybe your boss is indeed into a more outlaw style activities, I don't know, maybe not drugs but smuggling or something like that. It could, I mean that's the only way to explain in my view how he got in and out. Unless there's a window that was broken but you didn't mention that. Assuming if there is a window it would be locked. So, or maybe I guess he could pick it? Still, doesn't seem to quite add up to me. Unless your boss is into something more than he's letting on. Which also explains the apprehension in contacting the police. Yeah. Or, I mean, it could even be supernatural, but the way your boss reacted is almost like it's somewhat expected. And that's the end of the notes. Kinetic Symphony signing off. Case notes for file 837. The secrets of my supernatural phone. So, yet another expensive item returned. I think we owe a lot of uh, thanks to all these spirits and echoes that seem to be returning objects to us, at least that have significant value. It does seem to be what's happening. The objects are de-rendering from the universe, probably accidentally most of the time, and then reappearing sometimes in the same spot, but I think often not. They're reappearing where they were in time and space when they disappeared or de-rendered. And then these spirits and echoes that maybe are stalking us, I guess, following us, they know who it belongs to and they try to return it. And I think there's even more evidence of this happening because you tried to use your friend's phone to locate yours via the app and it, it didn't locate it. There was no known phone existing at the time sending a signal. Now, when you did find your phone, it wasn't turned off, it wasn't dead or anything. It really just didn't exist for a certain period of time and then it reappeared. Extreme evidence of the universe losing cohesion. Hopefully just this one and hopefully very slowly. Let's hope. Case notes for file 838. Children react to father that isn't home. Boy, this is a doozy one. I mean, your children don't remember reacting to their father being home, but do you still remember it? So it's not a case of astral projection, which is somewhat common. I've read quite a few stories where a loved one, significant other, friend even, just appears to come home or enter the house and then apparently they never did, they're still at work or something. But in this case, it's different because the people reacting to it don't remember reacting to it. So it's almost like there was a universal bleed through effect here. In a different universe, your husband did come home early, your children reacted to that, and you were hearing this, but then when you went to go and check on them, you were no longer receiving stimuli from that universe. You were back in yours. Although again, not back because I don't think you traveled there, it's just the sensory input. It's like the membranes are very very thin for a tiny moment, enabling that light and sound wave pressure to travel between universes so you're receiving that information, but you're not actually there. It's just the universes are maybe almost like tectonic plates 
crusting against each other. And then as a result, you can get information from that side. And very thinly, and only temporarily. But it does seem to happen quite frequently. Case notes for the bonus file. White creatures in the night. Somewhat strikes me as potentially shadow beings trying to cross over fully. Although congregating together is different, um, so maybe not. Just wild speculation there. Honestly, I've never heard of these kind of white creatures with dead eye sockets. Especially grouping together. I've also never heard of white zombies, so that's something to look up. But the fact you describe their limbs as dematerializing in their movements, making them seem jerky, does seem like they're not in cohesion with the universe. They're not exactly ghosts. There's like halfway between ghost and physical form. I don't have much experience dealing with that. This is the first story of its type I've read. And my notes are ending. Kinetic Symphony, signing off. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Case file number 839, written by Diablix. Me and my friend lost three hours. Some backstory before starting. This occurred in the summer of 2012. I've only experienced missing time incidents a few times, but will only share the story of the first time because that's the only one that had corroborating witnesses, so I could be absolutely certain of all the bizarre details. So, this friend, who we'll call Geo, would occasionally make what we jokingly called our game night Walmart runs. Basically, on some weekends, when some of our schedules lined up right, we'd be able to play video games late into the night like old times. We'd sometimes have to take a brief intermission to go get coffee, snacks, and energy drinks. These runs would typically occur around 2 or 3 a.m., and the reason we chose Walmart was because it was a Walmart that was only three-fourths of a mile away. On this particular summer night in 2012, energy drinks were the only things we were running low on, and so we figured we'd take a break a little early at 12.47 a.m. to go get just the energy drinks and head back. If you're thinking it's oddly specific that I remember exactly 12.47 a.m., we'll get back to that later. Gio and I volunteered to be the ones to head out for the drinks, and we hop in my car and drive straight to the Walmart. No red lights along the way. We head straight inside and spend only about 2-3 to three minutes in the store. Wanting to get back to our gaming night, we rushed to grab only what we needed and headed to self-checkout. We drove straight home and arrived at our other friends, seeming much more tired and exhausted than when we had left, and they asked what took so long. We thought they were joking and gave a smart-ass response of how long a drive it was. They seemed confused and demanded a more serious answer. That's when we got confused ourselves and asked what they were talking about. They showed us the clock and we couldn't believe it. It was 4.30 a.m. We also checked the time on our phones to confirm this. Yep, 4.30 a.m. At this point, we started telling them everything, how we rushed straight there, went through the store quickly and came straight back. They obviously weren't buying it. It's at this point we started double-checking to make sure we had our timeline right. They had sent us a text with a list of each of their preferred energy drinks, so we double-checked the time on that since they sent it seconds after we'd walked out the door. Yep, 12.47 a.m. Gio and I have discussed this incident a few times, trying to make sense of what happened. Ultimately, we've never been able to come up with any answers that make sense. As far as the friends we were hanging out with that night, I'm unsure if they believed us or not, that we really did go straight there and come straight back. It still makes me a little uneasy trying to untangle the confusion of what could have possibly happened that night. While neither Gio or I have any clue what happened that night, all we can seemingly agree on is that something odd must have happened that neither of us can remember. I remember the events as continuous, and I've confirmed with Gio that he does too. It's not the typical, we head there, get the drinks, and then there's a break in the memory, and then we head back. It's just a continuous sequence of events of driving there, rushing through the store to get the drinks to get back to our game night ASAP, and heading straight home. Case file number 840, written by Anonymous, Multiversal Showerhead. I was taking a shower and I couldn't switch the showerhead to jet mode, which I have enjoyed for having some naughty time in the shower all the 4 plus years we have been in this apartment. Called in my partner, thinking I couldn't get a hold of it covered in bubbles and slippery bath products, and he told me he doesn't think our showerhead has such a mode. I insisted it does, and I told him I've been using it for quite a while, and that he knows it. 
I'm quite open to discussing alternative preferences and things, and I'm also quite certain I use the jet mode to clean inside the tub quickly at times. So I insisted if he could just switch it from that particular part of the head, it would turn on. He tried and tried, and I rinsed and I looked and I looked, and no, our shower head doesn't have a jet mode now. Asked him if he changed the head, he said no, head doesn't look new at all either. He remembers me saying quite a lot of times that I had a fun time in the shower, but he has no recollection of it being over the jet mode of the shower head. I, on the other hand, am pretty sure I use the jet mode in this and that way many times, as it is one of my favorite ways to, um, you know. Also to rinse out bleach and other chemicals from the corners that are harder to reach while cleaning. I don't understand, most showers in my life I enjoyed this lovely stream of single jet water and now it's gone. Creepy file number 65, written by Unaffiliated, Rumble in the Neighborhood. About every month or so, my entire house shakes. It sounds like a large tree falling in the yard or the reverberation of an explosion. It lasts about two seconds and then it's gone. Every time it happens, I go outside to see if I can get an explanation, but nothing is out of the ordinary. Yet I also see several neighbors down the street coming out of their houses and looking up and around like they also heard it. This is in South Durham, North Carolina. We are near an airport, but planes flying by sound completely different, and there are no military bases nearby. I really have no idea what it could be. It's very creepy. Does anyone have a clue what this could be? I thought I should provide a small update. As far as I can tell, the closest quarry is about 12 miles east from me. There is another quarry about 18 miles to the west, and about 20 miles to the north is an iron mine. I don't believe I would be able to hear blasts from either of those distances. I am on the direct outskirts of Durham. To the north is civilization, and to the south is a large section of forest. If I were to guess, the sound originates to the south. They are clearing some of the forest next to the highway, southeast from me, to make room for housing, but I can't imagine they would need explosives for that. Durham is over a natural gas formation, the durham Sandford Subbasin, but as far as I know, they haven't started fracking here. I could be wrong. Case file number 841, written by Eternal Vacant, walking into a glitch in the matrix. Can't explain it. For a moment, I felt lifeless, but let me explain, or try to. I was walking in my neighborhood on a clear day and just on the sidewalk. I take daily walks in the afternoon to decompress from work stress, one foot in front of the other, feeling the rhythm of impact beneath my feet with each step, completely ordinary and meditative. Then comes the last step I can remember, pressing on the pavement, I remember feeling the concrete push back and then I'm just sitting at the dining room table with my wife and kid having dinner. Physically I didn't feel pain, I didn't feel anything, but mentally I couldn't even process reality for a few minutes. What could I possibly tell myself that would make sense? Do I have a tumor and somehow blacked out the last three hours? I got up and excused myself to the bathroom, telling neither of them anything. First I checked my phone and indeed all that time had passed, hours. Then I went to my computer to see if any work had been done. No. I never even clocked out. Work from home job, but there's still processes involved to clock in and out. Dealing with the workplace consequences of that would be annoying, but at the time, it was the last thing on my mind. To be clear, I have absolutely no history of blacking out of any sort of physical ailments. I cannot express to you how disconcerting it is to have no memory of the last few hours. To vividly remember the last memory you can, and the more I think about it, the more details emerge around that final moment before I was suddenly at the dining room table. It's like realities merged or something. I wish I could understand how this could happen. Case file number 842, written by Mary TKE. This woman is always on my walks. I live in a Dutch village with very few non-white inhabitants. Ever since quarantine, I started walking through and around the village at least once a day. I never really take the same roads and walk at random times of the day. Because I walk this often and the village is quite small, there's a few people I recognize on my walks. One year ago though, there came a new regular, an East Asian woman with mid-length hair. Every time I pass her, it's while I'm walking on this bridge. 
It's not a popular walking path, but I walk by her every time, without fail. I don't cross this bridge every day, and will go on my walks anywhere between 8am and 11pm, so it's not like we could have matching schedules. In fact, I've purposely gone on walks at weird times with bad weather to check if I'd still walk by her, and I did. It's not really scary or anything huge, but I just think it's so weird. Especially since she just suddenly started showing up a year ago. By the way guys, she's not dead. I don't see it as anything paranormal exactly, I just think it's some weird glitch causing us to meet constantly. Case file number 843, written by Kitty Feely. The best type of glitch, money. This happened to my roommate, we'll call her L, earlier today. I was there and witnessed this with her. Three months ago, Elle went out clubbing with two friends at a super packed club. She carried a money clip with her in her back pocket that had $500 in cash, her debit card and ID. At the end of the night while she was waiting outside for an Uber, she noticed her money clip was gone and immediately went back inside the club she was at to check if she left it at the bar or dropped it on the ground somewhere. After searching for 10 to 15 minutes, she couldn't find it anywhere. When she got home, she double checked her jeans. She didn't wear a purse or jacket. Then went to bed after, super upset. She regretted bringing the $500 she was gifted a few days prior for her birthday. She was planning on using that money for our trip to Hawaii the following month. So Elle called the club the next day to see if anyone had turned it in, but no luck. She figured someone must have stolen it out of her back pocket or must have dropped it and someone just kept it. Fast forward three months later to today, Elle came home from work went into her room and her exact money clip that she lost with her $500 debit card and ID was sitting right on her TV stand. She was in total shock and yelled out my name to come see what she was seeing. I ran into her room, glanced at what she was pointing to and instantly felt goosebumps all over my body. She asked me if I was pranking her at first, but she saw how confused I was and knew that wasn't possible. I was just as shocked as she was. We hadn't talked about that missing money clip in over a month. We both sat down and just stared at each other for a while, trying to make sense of it all. How? Bonus file, written by The Wizardry 90. My house is possessed. I'm male, 31, and going to be as completely honest as I can be. I purchased a home roughly two years ago after living in an apartment that was located right behind a cemetery. I have videos on my profile that show two of the many things that happened there. Here at the house, it seems like we were either followed or what was already there just kept doing its thing. We include my three children, female 12, female 10, and male 5. I am a single father. This does not bother them, only myself. It all started about three days after we moved in. I was in the kitchen and you can see the hallway that leads to the kids' room. I saw what looked like one of my kids run down the hall and into one of the rooms. Right after that, all three of my actual kids came running in from the front door from playing outside. I just thought, okay, whoa. After that, I would sleep in my room on the opposite side of the house from my kids' rooms. I would feel like one of them was coming in and laying on the bed. I would look over to ask if they were okay, and no one would be there. On one particular night, the same thing happened, only this time I felt a kid's arm lay across my back. I rolled over and what looked like a girl, smaller than my daughter's, jumped out of the bed and went into the bathroom. When this thing moved, I meant it moved. It went around 12 feet in a matter of roughly a second. Since then, it does not fail that at least two times a week, something paranormal happens. You can hear a door in the house close when I'm at home and the kids are at school or the occasional voice of a man and or woman having a conversation somewhere in the house. And of course, the bed incidents. It got to the point where I had three paranormal investigators come by and we all saw the girl run behind the kitchen island. It is not scary things going on, it's more that I feel uncomfortable sleeping in my room. So I just lay on the couch with the TV and a few lights on. At the corner of my eye, I could still see something darting in the hallways. Case file number 844, written by Rinzi2000. My lost earring returned to me after two years. So, a couple of years ago, I started a new job. As I was coming out one night from work, 
I did what a lot of us would do and ripped off my surgical mask to breathe in the fresh air. When I did it, I felt the earring come out of my ear because it got caught on the mask ear loop. I heard it hit the ground and I took my phone out to look for it, but it was a dark parking lot and I just couldn't find it. It was a small white gold hoop. I searched for it the next day during the daylight, but was unable to find it. It's a busy parking lot in the city, so I figured it was long gone. I was bummed because it was my favorite daily wear earring, and they were not super cheap to replace. I can only wear gold because everything else gives an allergic reaction, so I just haven't worn earrings for the last two years for fear of the same thing happening again. I put the remaining earring in my jewelry box because I keep my scrap gold jewelry in case I need to get something repaired. Well today, almost exactly two years later, I noticed something on my sun porch that was shiny. I reached down and picked up a small, white gold hoop earring. I thought it was weird because I remembered specifically putting it in my jewelry box in the little drawer where I keep my scrap gold. I went to the jewelry box and sure enough, there it was. So now I have the original set and no explanation how the missing earring made it back home. I have regularly vacuumed and swept that sun porch over the last two years and I specifically remember the incident in the parking lot because I was so bummed out about losing my earring. Case file number 845, written by Bunny Hope. I heard a drop and then it vanished. This was late at night, maybe around 2 a.m. Everyone living in my house was asleep and I was just scrolling through Twitter and TikTok. I had my AirPods in my ear and the case right next to me in bed. I had gotten up to grab another cover from my closet when I heard something drop. I assumed it was my fire stick, but when I returned to my bed it was still there. So I thought no biggie, it must have been my AirPod case. But when I went to look for it, I couldn't find it. I looked under my bed and under my dresser, but I still couldn't find the damn AirPod case. Since it was so late at night, I just decided to leave my AirPods on my nightstand and look for the actual case the next morning. The next morning, I began to clean my room and I mean deep clean. I moved my bed, my dresser, my nightstand, everything and anything. I even looked in my shoes and deep in my closet, but never found my case. I know it was late at night and I was tired, but I remember having it next to me and I remember hearing something fall to the ground. I even asked my mom to help look, but neither of us ever found anything. It was so strange and frustrating because one, they were expensive and two, my room isn't even that big so it's not like it's part of my room that I never got to. To this day, I never found the AirPod case and I had to end up buying a new one. Thankfully, they weren't as expensive. Case file number 846, written by El Gringo Jefe, The Sleeping Anomaly. I've had things seemingly show up in weird places before, but this one is one of the most difficult to explain for me. I came home from work the other night, pretty tired, and ate, showered and drank like one beer, went to pee and hopped into bed plugged my phone into the charger that reaches to my bedside and googled a couple random things like logging into my bank, etc. Then put on some YouTube documentary so I could go to sleep. I fell asleep probably around 10, with my phone still plugged in and on top of me with a video playing and woke up randomly at 5am. I was still in bed. I noticed after a few seconds that my phone wasn't plugged in, so I started feeling around for it thinking I had just popped it off the charger accidentally in my sleep. I started panicking and realized that my phone wasn't in my bed at all and turned on the lights and looked around. It wasn't in my room. My bedroom door had also been closed like I had closed it before sleeping. I had to pee pretty bad like I normally do in the mornings and when I went to the bathroom my phone was randomly on the side of my bathtub next to the toilet. I checked YouTube and it had played the entire video I fell asleep watching but didn't play anything else. My safari history showed nothing else after me checking my bank account. My phone somehow had a nearly full charge which I thought was weird since I had only just plugged it in when I started watching the YouTube video. My only theory was that maybe I had sleepwalked into the bathroom to go pee that night. But I have my doubts since I haven't been known to sleepwalk before and what's weirder is I know I didn't use that toilet in my sleep that night because my fill valve was broken and I would have to remove the lid on the tank and activate the fill valve with my hand and there was no waste in the bowl that morning. I still haven't figured out exactly how it happened and I'm pretty confused. 
I know I wasn't drunk either. I'm guessing either I'm a very high-functioning sleepwalker and had no idea, or something crazy happened. Bonus file written by To Sorrow and Back The Chill of Sorrow I live in a strange place, let's put it that way. I moved in here with my family last year. I'm 19 now. Looking for work, trying to make my own way in the world, you know? Anyhow, for the moment, I'm stuck here, and I hope that changes soon. In my room, the very first time I entered when I was bringing in boxes from the moving van, I felt a chill in my core. Nothing looked wrong, I just felt wrong. I think we've all seen Harry Potter by now, right? So how I'd describe the sensation is what I imagine it would feel like if you stood next to a Dementor, dread and sorrow. I begged my parents to let me change rooms, but they wouldn't listen, and I wasn't going to tell them why because I can barely explain it now. I tried to fall asleep on the couch most nights, when I could. My parents are early birds, so I'd sneak out to the couch. They'd often find me there in the mornings, but never punished me for it. Just thought it was weird. And they never mentioned feeling strange when they came into my room, which they often did. So, is it just me? In my head? Maybe. I don't think so. When I'm in my room, I can't focus. I can't imagine my life being happy. It's like something is taking my essence away. The only good news is that when I leave the room, it all comes flooding back to normal and then some. It's an insane roller coaster. Case file number 847, written by What's up, it's Semen. That time when reality repeated. I've experienced other glitches, but nothing of this magnitude or so readily obvious to my perception. This glitch was a couple months ago, and I'm still thinking about it, but I've just chalked it up to weird crap happening and things like glitches are bound to happen if you're paying attention. I was waiting in a hotel room for a ride. My room was on the ground floor with a view out of the peephole to the parking lot. Maybe three cars in the lot, so I was peeking out to see when my ride arrived. The initial event. I looked out of the peephole and saw a red car had pulled up, not my ride, and a girl getting out. She was talking on the phone far enough away I could hear her voice, but not what she was saying. She had on a yellow skirt and sunglasses, and yes, I creepily watched her for a few seconds because I'm a guy and she looked good, which is why I only remember the skirt. I'm a lower body appreciator. Anyway, she walked towards the building and I could clearly hear her say, I love you, in a goodbye way as she left my field of view. I didn't think anything of it and wandered back in my room for 30 to 90 seconds, hard to say exactly, but it wasn't long, at which point my ride texted me they were pulling in. Back to the door. I went back to the door and looked through the people again, I'm not sure why, and watched exactly the same scene replay. Girl in yellow skirt and sunglasses getting out of the same red car in the same spot on the phone, watched her walk towards the building on the phone and the same very clear, I love you closing statement. I cannot explain this. My first thought was logically someone could go back to their car if they forget something or whatever. This was exactly the same actions and conversation. I remember doing like the cartoon triple take and my mind being super incredulous at watching this repeat. Not sure what the hell happened and I'm just going with weird crap happens. Makes me think of deja vu in the matrix for sure though. And now I can't help but think, what did they change? Case file number 848, written by Crazy Chaos 24, Channel Suffering. So, about a year ago, I had fallen asleep with my TV remote right next to me on my bed. To preface this, I have no bed frame. It goes mattress, box spring, and then floor. The next morning, I woke up and my remote was gone. I thought that maybe it could have fallen off my bed, or I moved it by accident and didn't remember. But when I got up and began to look, it was nowhere to be found. I tore my bed apart and looked between my bed and the wall on the opposite side of the bed and that back wall, checking behind my nightstand, around my nightstand. I checked the end of the bed all around my TV and since that day, I have searched everywhere in my room and tore it apart and still have no idea where it could be. Both of my parents have denied taking it and even if they did, why keep up a prank for a year now, you know? I'm just absolutely baffled. Creepy file number 66, written by Library Synced, The Rocky Mountains Hitchhiker. 
This was back in April 2018. I had gone to Colorado for a concert and was just driving around checking everything out before and after. The day before the concert, I'm driving through the Rockies because I thought it'd be cool, I guess. It was already probably 9pm at this point. I get to a gas station and there's an old lady with a giant suitcase. I went inside, bought a pack of swishers, got gas and as I was leaving, she asked me for a ride. At the time, being young and stupid, I said sure, hop in ma'am. Then she had me get her giant suitcase in my back seat and we were off. The ride started off pretty normal at first, just talked about life. She did most of the talking, mostly about her kids and family. She claimed that she was hitchhiking to Alaska for some insane reason I can't remember. Anyways, I had some plant matter that I decided to just give her and let her enjoy the high while we were driving. Not sure why I did that. Maybe to get her to shut up a little. <laughs> Eventually, she asks if I want to try her version of plant matter, but keeps mentioning how it tastes funny. Which was absolutely a red flag, so I politely said no. Then she started getting weird talking about homeless camps where people smoke much stronger substances. Then I actually got a good look at her and realized she was probably like a 40 year old addict and not as old as I thought she was. Also, I think I saw an Adam's apple and that could have been a dude. Yeah. Anywho, she started pointing out the rest stop signs or whatever which were like 100 plus miles out and was trying to convince me to go to one with her. And kept saying, I don't have any money, but some people will have you provide inappropriate services if you give them a ride. And at this point, I'm actually driving like a maniac in the middle of a pretty bad snowstorm at the time, in hopes that I'm more visible and noticeable to people if anything were to happen. I was terrified for my life, politely refusing all of her advances. Finally, we get to a town on the opposite side of the Rockies from Denver, and I pull up to a gas station and say, Okay, I gotta go back to Denver and get some sleep. I'm dropping you off here. And all she said was, You're a very smart young man. And I helped her unload the suitcase and left, thanking God I was still breathing. If any of my actions are questioned, this was at the time of my life when I was particularly lost and not in a good mental state at all. I definitely shouldn't have been roaming Colorado by myself. Smaller guy, no weapon aside from a knife. Honestly, I'm incredibly lucky. Case file number 849, written by Pepcac. I saw my grandma in another universe. I was down the shore with my grandma and I came home from the beach. I went in the front door and it was unlocked, but I didn't see my grandma in her customary seat on the couch to the left of the door. I glanced at the totally bare and empty kitchen table. Then I figured she was in the bathroom so I walked into the back of the house to just call out that I'm here so she doesn't get scared about hearing the door opening. As I walked into her bedroom, I saw my grandmother laying on the floor between her bed and the wall, wearing a blue sweatshirt and jeans. She looked like she fell, but her face was between laughing, like, whoopsie, I fell, and pain. I took exactly two steps towards her and blinked and she was gone. I started to panic a bit and checked out the bathroom for her anyway for no other reason than I thought well that's where I was heading in the first place, she wasn't there. I ran out of the back room to the front of the house again and I saw on the kitchen table a very bright neon pink something there. I went over and picked it up, it was a note from my grandma saying she ran over to the neighbor's house and that she'd be back in a couple of hours. I called her cell phone and she answered and confirmed that's where she was. I don't know what or who it was that I saw because when my grandma did come home, she was wearing the same clothes that whatever I saw in the bedroom was wearing. Creepy File Number 67 Written by Anonymous Girl The Gift of Fear This story happened about 6 years ago now but still makes me wonder what would have happened if I didn't follow my gut instinct. I've always been very aware of my surroundings. Growing up, my parents and grandparents always instilled in my sister and I to be well aware of your surroundings, especially when you're alone and to follow your gut instinct if you feel like the situation you're in is off. Because of this, I've always left situations I felt a bad vibe from, no matter if things didn't seem too strange to others, why take the risk? I feel like your body knows what's up even if you can't see it. So anyways, fast forward to this day, I never finished high school. So I was doing a program at a college in order to get a certificate that was equivalent to a high school diploma in order to get into college. 
The college I was doing the program at was in the same city as me. However, I didn't have a car nor drove, so I had to take the bus to and from classes when I had them. Usually the bus ride altogether took about 45 minutes, and I had to transfer onto a second bus at one point. Up until this point, nothing weird or bad had ever happened to me while on my journey to classes. On this particular day, I had finished my classes and was waiting for the first bus to go home. Since my classes weren't regular classes, I usually finished before most of the students in the actual college courses got out. I only had one or two classes a day, which meant most of the time there weren't too many others waiting for the bus at the same time as me. The bus I was waiting for finally pulls up and I get on as usual. I grab a seat at the front of the bus and notice there's absolutely no one else on the bus but me. So I get happy knowing there won't be many stops on my ride home and therefore I'll get there quicker. About two stops later, the bus stops and a male passenger gets on. I think nothing of it at first and I'm still glad there's only one other person because it'll be a quick ride. As the man walks to take a seat on the bus, instead of sitting on the opposite side or the back, he sits right beside me, not even a seat over, literally right beside me. Now I'm thinking this is strange because usually when I get on the bus if there's plenty of empty seats I won't pick a seat right next to someone. I usually enjoy sitting by myself, listening to music on the ride, so I decided to get up and go to the back of the bus. While I'm sitting in the back, listening to music, the male passenger keeps staring at me every few seconds and is starting to make me feel uneasy. Up until this point I didn't really have any alarm bells going off in my head, but the more he kept looking at me, the more I started to get bad vibes. I eventually started having a really strong gut feeling like I needed to get off the bus. I can't describe it, but the bad vibes I was getting were making me feel super uneasy. I decided I was going to get off at the next intersection where a stop was, just in case he decided to do anything or follow me. At least I wouldn't be on a side street alone with no one there. So the next intersection stop is coming up and I press the button on the bus to be let off. As the bus is about to pull over and stop, I get up to walk to the door and notice the male passenger get up too. I think that's really weird. I decided to get off the front of the bus by the driver versus the back and the male passenger got off with me. At this point I'm freaked out and walk ahead a bit and notice he follows me. The bus is at a red light at the stop and the doors are still open so I decide to get back onto the bus thinking this man won't follow me. Wrong. He follows me back onto the bus. At this point I'm really freaked out and the bus driver closes the doors to drive away. I immediately say, sorry, I gotta get off at this stop. And he opens them again. And I notice the male passenger is again about to get up to get off with me. Thankfully, the bus driver closed the doors and drove off. I don't know if he knew the man was following me and decided to not let him off or if he just wanted to drive away now. But as the bus pulled away, I noticed the man who followed me standing at the front of the bus staring back at me. At this point I'm glad he's away from me, but I decide not to wait for the next bus because I don't know if this man was going to get off at the next stop and come walk back to the stop I was at and see me again. I ended up calling my mom to come pick me up. I'm glad my gut instinct knew something was up and I got off the bus before he followed me all the way home because I live on a side street that's about a 7 minute walk from the bus stop so who knows what would have happened. So sketchy man on the bus, let's not meet again. Case notes for file 839. My friend and I lost 3 hours. This is most peculiar given the way you frame this is that there was no gap in your memory, there was no black spot, a spot that just didn't exist. It was a continuous sequence of events and yet three hours passed that shouldn't have. I'm thinking like when I edit footage for these videos, there's always these gaps where if I don't use a fade or a dither dissolve or something, there'll be a jump cut where you can feel it. You know something happened there that isn't quite spliced correctly. You can feel it in your bones. And the same thing in our memories or similar where if something is not quite right, we know it. And so in, in this case, whatever altered your memory was seamless. And if it isn't a memory alteration, because in the events where there's time anomalies, there's also spatial anomalies usually, and you certainly would notice if time was decelerating around you, 
when you're still driving. Like even in the branches moving in trees and the wind and all that. So I'm thinking this is actually probably an alien abduction where the memory splice that they do was seamless. No errors this time. Maybe aliens are indeed abducting a lot of people and we just aren't quite aware of it because the memory alterations usually are seamless. It's only in the cases where they're not that we hear about it. Case notes for file 840. The Multiversal Showerhead. Welcome to your new universe. One where, sadly, you don't have jet mode on your showerhead. I guess you have to pay extra for that in the server lobby. Hmm. Wonder what the currency is in the real world. Case notes for the creepy file number 65. Rumble in the neighborhood. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of the hum, where there's a noise that some people can hear. A low, deep rumble. Sort of. And yet other people in the same area can't hear it. They've even had people try to measure it and they can detect a signal, but they don't know where it's from. They can't pinpoint a source or a cause. It's probably one of the most well-recognized anomalies. Maybe one day we'll discover what the cause is, I hope so. That's the end of my notes for today. Enjoy your evening, folks. Kinetic Symphony, signing off. Case notes for file 841. Walking into a glitch in the matrix. So the first consideration here is that you say you have no medical history of blackouts or any sort of memory issue. It's unlikely to be medical. Now there are some diseases that can manifest later in life where it'll alter your memory. Although creating entire blackouts, that's very rare. I would get checked out just in case because you never know. But assuming it's not medical, I would have to rule out alien involvement, sadly, because it's just, you know, the middle of the day, urban, suburban environment, I assume. Not exactly the classic case for alien abductions. There is something else going on these days that isn't really talked about. It's called SADS, or Sudden Adult Death Syndrome. They don't really know what's causing it, and people are just literally dying randomly, and more frequently than before. There's no clear cause, but it seems to be affecting even uh, younger people. So people you wouldn't expect to die are just dying. And I guess in that case, this could fit. You're just walking around normally, everything is fine. And then you take your final step in that universe, you die, and now you're in a different universe. The time anomaly is weird. Normally uh, in quantum immortality, you uh, occupy the vessel in another universe virtually instantly in terms of timelines. There's no divergence. Sometimes there is. Usually actually it's rewinded in the past like 10-30 minutes. Fast forwarding to the future is curious. Maybe there was a glitch in the crossover event. I would imagine it's not always seamless. Case notes for file 842. This woman is always on my walks. You know, thinking about this, this similar thing happened to me too. But not walking when I was biking back in Montreal. Uh, Telbun, actually. On the path I would always take, it would usually take the same path, but I wouldn't always go at the same time. I would go anywhere from, you know, 11 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m., even after dark sometimes. But there was this old man that was also biking, and he would always be biking back towards me. No matter when I went, it didn't matter the time of day, He would, I would always see him. It's the weirdest thing. I mean, technically it could just be a coincidence, as <laughs> somehow we just chose the same time to go every other day, never attributing it to a glitch, but yeah. It is uh, quite a coincidence, isn't it? Case notes for file 843. The best type of glitch. Money. Now this is quite a glitch. And yeah, $500 is nothing to scoff at. To have that in a money clip just on you, it's a lot of money to carry around. The fact it came back months later is just baffling to me. Obviously it's not a prank, you're the one reporting it for your friend. Things dematerialize all the time. Maybe we don't realize that they're coming back instantly on us? Maybe the universe has errors, and in these errors are fixed by entities that want to restore our property to us. I think they only bother doing so if it's somewhat valuable, which $500 would be. If you die and you're an echo, and you have some fragment of sentience left, and you want to restore someone's property, well first you have to find out who it belongs to. I don't know if they get the special information, like the they can see the universe's code and they can say like, okay, this object belongs to Kitty Feli's friend. You know, and then they have the address pop up like a HUD display. So they go, okay, you know, this is the address and, but they don't have a car or anything. So they still have to walk that distance. Although taking two months is pretty long. Kind of neat idea that they would have this information available to them to know what belongs to who, their address, and they can just walk there. Do they have Google Maps as well? Like spiritual Google Maps? <laughs> that would be a neat twist. Case notes for the bonus file. My house is possessed. The fact that your children were left unaffected 
that they were never scared in any way. It's almost like the spirits there were intending to leave them out of it. Sort of like this chivalrous agreement between uh, mobster gentlemen back in the day where they would leave women and children alone. So only you, the man, is going to be pranked or disturbed in any way. Hmm. Very interesting spirits you have there. But at least you can say, at least in appearances, that they're not malevolent. They don't appear to be trying to do you any harm or anything like that. Not really even moving objects around or, you know, just closing doors, keeping you on your toes, I guess. But uh, nothing too bad. Still, I'm not sure I would want to live there. I hope uh, you settle in okay. But always be willing to move if anything bad starts happening. Don't tough it out. I don't recommend that. <laughs> and those are my thoughts. Kinetic Symphony, signing off. Case notes are file 844. My lost earrings returned to me after two years. It keeps striking me, <laughs> sort of like a lightning bolt, that these objects returning, it feels like a will is involved. And I, I've mentioned before now, but I do think there are spirits, entities, echoes, people from the past, maybe out of boredom. You know, what else are you going to do besides roam around? You might as well help people, right? They're helping to return items that are lost. Unless it's just a random happenstance from the universe, like the object de-renders, there's an error, and then somehow it's fixed. Maybe by a server GM in the real world, it's possible too. But if it's a GM in the real world, or a spirit, there's some force involved that has a will to return objects. It doesn't seem like it's a natural phenomenon, because it's too precise. After two years, I mean, that is so much travel through space-time that it has to be some sort of force involved with a will and mind of its own. And again, I think it explains why the object's return often seem to be high value. Why bother if it's just a tennis ball, right? Case notes for file 845. I heard a drop, and then it vanished. Right, so here we are again, uh, another object that's vanished, but this time it didn't return, because I guess it's not as expensive. There's just not as much um, importance to return it. Although it's still annoying for you, I'm sure. It's an AirPod case, which, you know, it's not nothing. What always gets me about these stories, though, is that you hear it drop. You know it actually fell to the ground, you had it, and then it's just gone. Now, these objects are just de-rendering before our ears, not our eyes, before our ears. And that still counts as being crazy. Case notes for file 846. The Sleeping Anomaly. Right, I'm not entirely well versed on sleepwalking. I don't know how common it is for it to emerge suddenly later in life. To my limited knowledge, it seems to emerge when we're younger, and it's a habit that forms from there. So is it possible that you suddenly developed sleepwalking? Or maybe you've had it and you just n no one ever told you? Less likely on that, if it suddenly emerged, I could see that as a viable possibility. You uh, woke up, you sleepwalked, you brought your phone into the bathroom, didn't really do anything in there because you couldn't use the bathroom as you described, and then just went back to bed. And maybe there was a tiny gap, but as soon as you got back into bed, you really woke up for real. Something like that, I could see makes sense. Uh, with your phone being charged up, I mean, presumably after many hours of being plugged in, is that weird? For me, I mean, my phone charges pretty quickly, so that seems normal. If you did sleepwalk, then I assume you did it towards the end of the sleeping cycle, in which case, yeah, plenty of hours for it to charge up, and not many that was off charging. If it was some supernatural force, then it kind of feels like a possession event. Because it does seem like your physical body did travel there to bring the phone there. Unless some entity just took it and brought it there, but why would they do that? Maybe you have a trickster on your hands. Case notes for the bonus file. The Chill of Sorrow. So, how I think about ourselves and our spirits, they're signals. Ripples in a pond, they travel, but in this case the ripple is perpetual, and it's enclosed within a given environment. It doesn't ripple out forever. They're like reverberations in the fields of reality, where we have the EM field, you have the Higgs boson field, and all these various fields where excitations of the field is what we view as reality. If you apply that to a human being and their soul, if a soul exists in some um, field that we haven't quite calibrated or uh, measured yet, well, the excitation of that field would depend on the person. It would uh, vary based on like any other particle, it would have properties. And I think this field depends on our character, our moral fiber. So if we're good people, the excitation is going to be different from someone that's very negative. And I think even after you die, there's an imprint left behind. I think the um, reverberation in the field is reduced. I think it's more of a fragment of what was there before, but it still exists. And I think you describe it pretty well, like the Dementor, where it's like sapping your energy. 
and your will to be positive or your ability to be positive for the future. But then as soon as you leave, the interaction stops. It's like the electrical field where there's a very strong force, but as soon as you leave, it doesn't have any effect on you anymore. It seems very related to fields and signals. Now that said, it's interesting that your parents didn't seem to feel anything when they entered your room. Or maybe they did, but they didn't want to admit it to themselves or you. They want to be serious people that don't entertain, not magic, but just anomalies or things that aren't entirely understood yet. They did feel that, and they didn't want to punish you for not sleeping in your room. That makes a lot of sense to me. That your parents felt it too, they just wouldn't admit it, but they also didn't want to punish you for trying to avoid it. I could see that fitting pretty well. And that's the end of my notes for today. Enjoy your evening, folks. Kinetic Symphony, signing off. Case notes for file 847. That time, reality repeated. So I'm increasingly convinced that we do live in a buffered reality. You saw a scene repeat, because indeed, something was changed, and maybe that's why it repeats. Maybe the Matrix was actually spot on with that theory. If something is has to be altered in the universe by the developers, there's a certain reset, at least local, that has to happen. So a certain scene that's already buffered is re-instituted, replayed, because an alteration is made that isn't along that pre-rendered timeline. And that makes sense because otherwise the domino effect, the butterfly effect would reverberate and the changes would be immense. Basically the whole scene would replay. Think of a video game where you can resume from replay and then you make even a couple different choices in that tiny amount of time and then the whole thing will end differently or can. So the small choices have a massive impact in the long term. But I think that it's tailored specifically where most people won't notice it. So it's always happening behind closed doors and elevators, out of sight, out of mind. I don't think you were supposed to look through that peephole a second time. Or maybe it just didn't really matter that you know. It's a small glimpse into the true reality. And now that you know, well, you can tell others, but I guess we can't do much about it. At least as far as we know. But yeah, true déjà vu. Case notes for file 848, Channel Suffering. Yeah, just another classic case of DOP. I don't think it will ever return, it's too low value an item. I think ultimately the universe doesn't really care about those, it's a total apathy. It de-rendered, it's not supposed to be gone, but it is. And yeah, along the buffered timeline, maybe it's related to how impactful not having that item around will affect the pre-rendered timeline. Maybe if, for instance me, losing my tennis balls, if somehow not having those tennis balls would massively shift where I end up in life, then they would have been returned. <laughs> but I don't think it did. I still would be here making stories even if I had my tennis balls. So, I don't have them back. Oh well. <laughs> Case notes for the creepy file number 66. The Rocky Mountain Hitchhiker. Man, that's a creepy line. When she said that, you're a very smart man. That's like uh, what a predator would say when it's admiring its prey that escaped its clutches. Like yeah, just giving a bit of praise where it's due, right? I don't think she had anything good planned for you. At the very minimum, she wanted to rob you, I would guess. And maybe more. It's even possible that this was related to human trafficking. It's a plague that most people don't really think about, but it's very widespread. It affects hundreds of thousands of people everywhere. So it's no joke. Be careful out there. Case file number 849, I saw my grandma in another universe. So possibly related to buffered reality you just saw a scene from the future, something that will happen but hasn't yet. I'm not as inclined to believe that, mainly because you mentioned that your grandma was wearing the same thing you saw in the bedroom when it was just a, a vision as uh, when she came home. So my gut is that there was some sort of astral projection involved, maybe even as a subconscious soul linked defense mechanism. Maybe grandma did fall over at her neighbor's house in the same orientation and everything, but it wasn't really a grave thing. You know, she was in some pain, but overall just an accident and she's okay. I don't know if you asked her if she did fall over, but that's that's my, my gut instinct, is that your grandma has some sort of uh, soul guard in, in place. So if something bad happens to her, she will appear to you and maybe to others as well as a sort of a metaphysical SOS. It's kind of cool. Very powerful and protective. I like that idea. Case notes for the creepy file number 67. The Gift of Fear. 
I read a book recommendation called The Gift of Fear, so I titled the story that. Fear isn't just this thing that we should get rid of. It's kind of like pain. It's a signal. And it's our subconscious in this case, telling us that things aren't right. It's not always accurate. Maybe it'll jump the gun a bit in some cases. But I think often it is very accurate. So trusting your gut is always a good idea. As they say, it's better safe than sorry, right? But in the book specifically, it says that violence is very predictable. The signs that lead up to it are, they're not exactly unambiguous, they're pretty clear. And in this case, specific to your story, they weren't even red flags. They were giant neon glowing signs of redness, you know. Uh, everything that could be uh, off about this guy was off. I mean, it's almost impossible that he wasn't trying to do something to you because he kept getting on and off with you. And also sitting right next to you, I mean, he wasn't even a good predator too, you know. Why be so obvious? <laughs> it's just, yeah... At least it's good when uh, bad people are dumb, because then they're kind of easy to avoid. It's when bad people are actually smart and clever that you have to be very well on guard. We should all be very thankful for this gift of fear.